Let's see. Um, Vice Mayor Du Bois. Here. Council Member Nis. Here. Chair Tanaka. Here. Three present. Okay, um, let's start off with oral communications. Uh, so um, anyone that wants to speak on something that's not on agenda, please raise your hand in Zoom and uh, Danny could uh, let you guys in to speak. Yeah, of course. Again, if you wish to speak on any items not on the agenda, please raise your hand in the app or dial star nine on your phone. And at the moment we have David Kennedy um, I'm going to allow you to speak. And if you would like your video on as well, please let me know. Excuse me, David Kennedy will be speaking later in our section about the museum. Oh, he probably doesn't realize that. So we could just um, put him for the, um, for the museum item. Okay, um, are there any other speakers? Otherwise we'll, we'll close um, oral communications and move to action items. Uh, so far there are no other speakers besides David Kennedy. Okay, so let's uh, close oral communications and move on to the first action item. Uh, discussion with the Palo Alto History Museum and recommended di direction to the city council regarding options for the rehabilitation and future use of the Roth building, including funding, construction, phasing, and financial support requested by the museum. Um, does staff have a presentation? Uh, oops. Yes, good evening, Finance Committee. Um, Kylie Jose, Administrative Services Director. Uh, there's a two-part presentation tonight. Staff will start, uh, David Ramberg, our Assistant Director, uh, who will then turn it over to the uh, Palo Alto Museum. David? I think you might be muted. Thank you for that. Good evening, Chair and members of the Finance Committee. My name is David Ramberg with the Administrative Services Department. Uh, tonight, uh, we will be discussing potential direction for next steps regarding the Roth Building at 300 Homer Avenue. I will cover a couple of overview and background slides and then get into uh, some more of the details. We have a total of about nine slides and then we'll turn it over to uh, part two of the presentation with the Palo Alto History Museum. Um, as I mentioned, we are discussing the Roth building, which for um, roughly the past couple of decades has been an ongoing project here at the city. And for the bulk of those years, we've been in partnership with the Palo Alto Museum um, on, the, on the project. The project is a two-phase project. Um, phase one, um, as currently planned, is to uh, build out the museum uh, at a cost of about 10, to build out the building at a cost of about 10.5 million, which would produce a to totally rehabbed Roth building and what we're calling a warm shell, um, ready to be moved in and turned into um, a museum. We will also be talking about a variation of this, uh, which is called the cold shell option in a couple of, a uh, few more slides. Tonight, staff is seeking consideration of potential funding options uh, and any limitations and recommendations for next steps to uh, present to the city council. And some of the considerations for tonight is that the Roth facility and funding of the rehabilitation of the building, and also um, considering tonight the lease agreement between the city and Palo Alto Museum. A little bit of background here showing a, a timeline over the past couple of decades. I won't touch on every item here, but um, hitting come up some of the key milestones. In, in uh, 2000, the city purchased the Roth building and improved, approved it as a historic designation. Uh, in 2005, uh, the city uh, council approved a 40-year lease with the Palo Alto Museum. Um, note, noting here also that uh, they also are referred to as the Palo Alto History Museum, but Palo Alto Museum is the, uh, the new name, but you might see it as both. I'm sure you all know that. And jumping ahead to the 2014-2017 timeframe, there were several one-year extensions during this period of time. 
Um, and there was also a city council uh, targeted fundraising limit of 1.75 million um, that they set for the Palo Alto Museum. In 2019, the building permit was issued and the building permit is still active. Um, and in 2020, uh, the city staff completed a donation review and presented uh, those findings to the city council. Which brings us to the most recent city council actions. A brief recap here. On March 2nd of this year, um, we did um, present the um, outcome of the review of donations. And coming out of that meeting was a, mo a four part motion from uh, the city council to um, move forward uh, with an RFP, including potential rezoning of the site, additional looking into additional possible shared space arrangement, uh, returning with a status report, and uh, referring to the finance committee uh, for the discussion of the possible build out and financing for that. Uh, we're really focusing here tonight on item number D, uh, which is the finance committee referral. Item number C uh, was um, uh, presented in an information report in the June timeframe and the uh, CMR number is there. Um, and then also in June, um, which also um, points to what we're meeting on tonight, the city council during the fiscal year 21 budget deliberations reaffirmed uh, the prioritization of item D in this motion and referring it again to the finance committee. Uh, which brings us to um, us here tonight. In your packet, um, uh, there is attachment number A to the staff report. Um, staff report 11611 in your packet is a letter from Palo Alto Museum. And uh, there are three components to uh, what we're calling the Palo Alto Museum request uh, that's being presented here tonight. Um, there is a uh, funding request um, that the city fund the remaining phase one construction cost of about 3.71 million that would um, complete the warm shell uh, build out. Um, there, the second component is issuance of a 40 year lease between the city and Palo Alto Museum, which would free up donor funds to be released for construction costs. And then finally, um, item number three in their letter is to commit to a partnership for the rehabilitation of the Roth building and mutual long-term success. We're gonna jump into a little bit of the financial um, uh, components here of, uh, and relevant information for tonight's discussion. Uh, this slide shows a, uh, the financial status summary of phase one. And focusing on the left side of the slide first, uh, there's a couple notes here that's important to point out. The Palo Alto Museum has spent roughly 1.8 million to date on preparation work and preparation of the plans and getting the building uh, permit issued. Uh, phase one, um, as I mentioned earlier, could potentially be broken into two sub phases, um, as I might call them, uh, one being, um, the uh, phase 1A, you might say, which would be construction of the cold shell. The cold shell could largely be um, funded with existing funds um, that have already been reserved to date. Uh, that cost is uh, 6.5 uh, million, and that would stop short of making the building inhabit um, habitable uh, for the museum or any other uses. It would not build out the interior of the building, but it would make the buildings um, structurally sound, um, seismically sound, as well as deal with some uh, any other issues that are needed to uh, bring it up to uh, par as a building. The um, phase 1B, as we might call it, would be um, completing the full build out, uh, either uh, sequentially or after a pause. And that would cost, um, that would be the remainder of from, from 6.5 million to 10.5 million, which is about 4 million um, additional funds. Uh, as, as noted there, uh, any um, two-phased approach could incur an additional up to $500,000 plus inflation costs if they were broken out into two phases. And that has to do with um, uh, not sequencing and um, economies of scale of having everything in one phase. Um, Focusing on the right side here, I just wanted to recap a little bit of the funding that's set aside to date. Um, 
there are readily available funds of about six million dollars and that is made up of already reserved funds um, that have been set aside over the years uh, via council action and other actions and they comprised of tdr proceeds transfer of development right sale proceeds and a one million contribution from the general fund there's uh, there's some money about three hundred thousand from the county of santa clara for grants and library impact fees um, that have been previously designated uh, for to cover the cost of the city archives, which would be housed in the Roth building. The Palo Alto Museum also has cash on hand um, of about uh, 0.5 million, 500,000 or so. And that brings us to that $600,000 figure and leaves us short, um, as you see there, of about 4.5 million to get to the full build out of phase one. Um, the next line shows you Palo Alto Museum pledges of somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 to 500,000. Um, that's potentially a conservative figure. Um, it's the figure that we've used from our external audit that was um, uh, performed by MGO uh, that was presented to council in March. And what we're saying there is that those are the most likely collectible pledges because pledges are not monies that have been received yet. So we're identifying uh, the lower end of um, what um, Palo Alto History Museum has estimated it to be closer to a million dollars in outstanding pledges. So possibly some um, uh, flexibility there in that number. Uh, then below that are um, additional potential funds, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, more in the next slide, comprised of city impact fees, um, additional um, uh, available city impact fees, and additional uh, city impact impact fees that were, 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 would require defunding of planned projects. Um, and then there's uh, potential uh, Stanford University Medical Center uh, funds available um, potentially and the general fund and capital uh, improvement fund um, figures as well. And we'll cover uh, a little bit more of that in a minute. And all of that would round out to about 10.5 million with those additional funds that would potentially close the gap on the phase one construction. Um, moving on to uh, a more, more discussion on the impact fees, this slide shows you a breakdown of um, what we're calling available impact fees of about $600,000 and um, uh, potentially eligible impact fees of $3.1 million. And it's uh, worth going through this in a little bit more detail uh, to make sure that we're, we're clear um, and reminding folks of, of uh, the restrictions on impact fees, among other things. Um, the uh, under community center, for instance, we show 2.3 um, eligible. Um, that 2.3 is already allocated to um, uh, or, or committed to um, existing projects, uh, which would require, if usage of that money would require it, uh, either a reprioritization or a defunding of, of existing projects. So there's presently, um, um, only 1 million that's unallocated of community center funds. And similarly for the library fees, um, there's 500,000 eligible and 0.2 million available um, and park fees, uh, uh, 0.3 million uh, eligible and 0.3 million available. Um, it's worth noting that and reminding everyone that library uh, fees um, may only be used for developments and improvements to libraries. Uh, the park fee may, may be used for only acquisition of land and improvements for neighborhood and district parks. Um, and then the community center uh, fees uh, may be used only for development and improvements to community centers. So there are uh, definitely restrictions um, on, on these various fees. Uh, moving over to the right side of the slide, there is a breakdown of the Stanford University Medical Center funds where there are currently um, um, less than 3 million in unallocated balance. Um, in those funds and those funds have been previously used for project safety net because they are in the community and health and safety bucket. Um, and then within the general fund, if there were either operating or capital funds used, uh, there would be a needed reprioritization um, or a rearrangement of priorities um, for existing projects. Um, moving on then to um, a discussion of the lease or potential lease option. A couple of notes here um, and a reminder, um, it, we, we would need to, the city would need to enter into a lease or a lease option 
um, with uh, Palo Alto Museum uh, to free up donor funds the, to go towards the rehabilitation of construction. Um, and um, the um, lease option might be the route to go um, if there are certain thresholds that we need to still have Palo Alto Museum meet. Um, as a reminder, um, the lease option has uh, been on the table for since about 2007, uh, but it was never uh, formally executed. Um, so the next point here is that there are a number of potential lease terms to consider. Um, uh, one being the term of the lease, and uh, as uh, previously shown, the um, History Museum is requesting a 40-year term, uh, which is consistent with what was um, um, previously um, um, conceived of in, in the prior um, lease option. And a demonstration of financial commitments um, obviously would be um, a potential lease term, which we would need to consider. And um, then making the public restroom available to park users as well as a community meeting room. Um, noted here in the, the final bullet is that the Palo Alto Museum has expressed um, a desi desire to share space with a non with a for profit entity, which would be um, different than what what is currently stipulated, which is sharing space with only a nonprofit organization. So tonight, um, what we're um, um, presenting to Council is really uh, a, a series of options, uh, potential options, uh, three of them pretty discreet, um, and uh, the fourth option being a variation of uh, potentially the three prior options, and I'll walk through those. These would be a finance committee recommending to the City Council to, to direct staff to. Uh, one, I, uh, one option could be to pursue only the cold shell. Um, at 6.5 million and return with additional funding at, uh, to make up that final 6.5 million, which it, we're estimating to be about 500 to a million dollars um, to get the cold shell completed. And, and also combine that with the returning with a lease option um, or lease agreement with um, Palo Alto Museum. Option B uh, could be to pursue the full uh, build out, um, the full warm shell of the Roth building at, 10 point, at a $10.5 million cost and return with additional funding plan for the remainder, uh, which is about four to 4.3 million, um, as well as a long-term lease uh, uh, agreement with Palo Alto Museum. Uh, uh, option number C really is to return to what um, council has uh, previously considered uh, on a couple of occasions, which is um, going back out with an RFP to see uh, what might uh, what additional new options might be available um, if we were to look afresh at the Roth building uh, project. Um, item um, option D really is to um, uh, could combine any of the above uh, options, uh, pick and choose as it were, um, and uh, or combine with a fundraising target, which has been uh, previously on the table, um, as well as uh, consider a termination clause or particular timing um, milestones that must be met. Um, is another possibility um, it, to coincide with any um, possible lack of funding um, uh, if uh, new milestones were um, required. And with that, I will uh, turn it over. I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over um, to Rich Green from the Palo Alto Museum, if that works okay for everyone. Thank you. That works. Rich, why don't you go ahead? Okay. I am going to share my screen. Boom. Okay. Does that look okay? All right. Well, thank you, David, uh, for that uh, summary. And thank you, uh, council members, finance committee members, and city staff for your incredible work over these past, it's been eight and a half months since the March 2nd motion. Um, I have some panelists with me tonight. I'll be the one speaking through this presentation, but I just wanted to let you know that we have some panelists on board to answer questions as they come up during our discussion. I've got Laura Bajuk, our Executive Director and Development Director, John Northway, um, a Board of Directors of the Museum, as well as legendary architect and uh, founder of Stecker and Northway Architects. Um, Tim Stitt, I'm hoping, has joined us. He is with Vance Brown Construction. He knows all the intricacies 
of the build out details for the rehabilitation project. And the Honorable Karen Holman is with us, a former council member, former mayor, and the founder of this project many years ago. Uh, we like to use a slogan, um, Palo Alto has local history and global impact. Um, we are building a museum because of this extraordinary city. I think we're all in agreement here that the Palo Alto needs and wants a history museum in the Roth building. This discussion is really about how to complete funding for the rehabilitation of the Roth building, which is in pretty serious decline. So we need to be cautious not to conflate the funding for the repair of the city owned building with the creation of a history museum. The funding for the history museum will be entirely private uh, with no funds coming from the city. Now, I wanna make sure that's very clearly understood uh, by everybody. We actually had a history, history museum once. I don't know if you know this, uh, back in 1904, we opened the Carnegie Library and Paha, uh, celebrating its 113th year, uh, had a little room in the basement where they curated the archives and memorabilia. Uh, that building was torn down in 1967 to make room for City Hall. So that was the end of our run of a history museum in Palo Alto. That was 53 years ago. Uh, County Supervisor Joe Simidian says, it's important to tell the next generation about our history and without the Palo Alto History Museum, it's hard to imagine that happening. We feel very strongly about building this museum in the Roth building. The, clearly the city gains from a continued partnership with the museum. We have created a shovel ready project for the city. Uh, it's taken a long time uh, and we've put a lot of effort and money into that. Um, I will say that there has been some uncertainty in the city partnership and we'd like to um, move forward from that uncertainty. Uh, in part, the March 2nd motion and before that uh, events in December uh, 2017 and 2018 um, have been sending mixed signals, which doesn't sit well with the donor community we've been nurturing all these years. And we are very eager to move forward. The Roth building is very important building in the city's infrastructure portfolio. Uh, it embodies the legacies of a whole lot of people, the entrepreneurs who founded the Innovative Clinic, the six founding doctors, including Dr. Edward Roth, a woman who broke into a medical profession then dominated by men, that was Dr. Esther Clark, a celebrated artist whose creations still remain controversial, that's Victor Arnatoff, Stanford art professor, and a nationally recognized architect whose life work has helped define our civic, civic image, that of course is Burge Clark. The Palo Alto Museum in the Roth building will provide many public amenities otherwise not available. It rehabilitates the National Register listed Roth building. Uh, this is already done according to the Secretary of Interior standards. Uh, provides that sorely needed public restroom for the park visitors out there by the playground. Uh, it's a permanent home for the city owned historic archives. That's the Paha managed archives provides community meeting spaces, and I'm gonna show you what those look like, um, provides Palo Alto and Stanford exhibits, historical and current, and really important, it provides second to fourth grade supplement to required studies. The kids will be spending a lot of time in this building learning about local history hands-on. And we also provide a Parkside Cafe. Um, it's a place for research, to research persons, places, events, especially relevant to the Palo Alto and Stanford community. Uh, places a play, it provides a place to record oral and video histories. More important now, as some of the, these critical people are passing away, um, we provide a venue for speakers, authors, thinkers, artists, musicians, performers in a setting that supports their topics. And it provides a lab, kind of like a maker lab where teens and retired engineers can work together on evolving technologies. Um, and it's a unique venue for events among historical artifacts and interpretive art, which really makes for a powerful presentation when you are immersed in significant artifacts. So what goes on inside the Roth building? Uh, I've got scale drawings of the first, second and 
basement floors and they're color coded. Uh, the light red areas that you see, those are actual museum programming. So what you see there are the permanent exhibits. Uh, Dr. Esther Clark's office is in there, uh, room 117. We're gonna restore her office. Uh, we have a rotating gallery in the upper left-hand corner, and there's another rotating gallery on the second floor right above it. So that's the actual museum uh, programming space. The yellow areas that you see are actually more akin to community center use. So as you walk in through the front doors where the Arnatoff murals are, you walk into the Leonard and Shirley Ely Legacy Hall. That's the largest presentation space in the building. This is where you would have book signings and historical presentations and, uh, and various other events that people in the community would like to use in this uh, gorgeous building. Down just below that Legacy Hall is the Education Resource Room. This is where the second, third, and fourth graders will huddle and uh, kind of orient themselves before they go into the museum for their history studies. So that's very much an education resource. Up in the right corner is the community room that was required by the original RFP. And you can see it's got patio doors that open up on our colonnade that faces uh, Heritage Park, a very cool place to hang out. We also have a cafe there, there so you can grab a coffee and a, and a bagel and, um, and enjoy the gorgeous Heritage Park. Up on the second floor, we've got uh, at the front, I think it's the most beautiful room in the building. It's the Pitch and Kathy Johnson boardroom. And this is a boardroom that will be used by PAHA. It will be used by the museum. It will be used by any community organization that would like to have a, a board meeting in an elegant facility. So that's very much community use. Up in the upper right corner, those are the, Gil, the Guy Miller City Archives. Those are the PAHA run archive spaces, um, which are mandated uh, by the city. And currently those archives are very temporarily housed uh, over at Coverly. You can see uh, some more museum programming there, the Bill Miller Media Archives, a media studio, another rotating exhibit gallery, and then a little staff and volunteer office. I want to go back and show you that gray area down in the bottom right corner. That is a potential shared space. And after a lot of thought, we carved out that space to share with a nonprofit or for-profit or perhaps even a city department. Um, it has its own entrance and exit. It has access to the bathrooms, but it's reasonably private and separate from the rest of the building. We think that is a, a very attractive space for a possible co-tenant. And then uh, there's a little there's a little room up on the, on the roof. I'm not gonna talk much about the roof, but someday we'd like to put a fantastic cafe up there on the roof. And then down in the basement, we have our collections, storage and exhibit preparation area, plus more potential shared co-tenant space. So we've run the numbers and we've looked at the square footage of each usage area. And when you add the pro rata portion of common areas, we come up with these square footage, um, 1,672 feet for the archives, 4,850 feet for the community center usage, 7,983 far and away the largest for the museum programs, and then a potential shared space of about 3,500 feet. And when you do the math, and we've calculated approximately uh, $630 per square foot, uh, you, this is how we arrived at the valuations for potential use of impact fees. Uh, many of you have seen this slide before. This is our path to making a shovel ready project. Uh, the total cost of the rehabilitation project, not the museum, just the fixing the old building is 12.3 million. And uh, the, over the years, the museum has invested over $1.8 million in architecture and revisions to architecture, uh, permits and the overhead to support those efforts. So that leaves the rehabilitation budget at 10.5 million. And then you start subtracting the funding resources that we have identified, uh, the museum cash on hand, 
Uh, museum pledge is outstanding. As David Ramberg said, uh, there is a discounted value to that in the city report. So it will be somewhere between probably half a million and $1 million when the pledges are called in. The museum has been instrumental in generating the transfer of development right sales, the TDRs, uh, which uh, uh, adds up to over uh, 4.1, uh, 4.2 million dollars. Uh, we've uh, worked really hard with the city to acquire county grants, historic county grants, uh, at over three hundred thousand uh, dollars. The city, from the general fund many years ago, um, dedicated uh, one million dollars toward the repair of the back wall of the building, which was, uh, which is temporary and fragile. Uh, $300,000 in library impact fees have already been allocated to the project that is to support the city archives. So that comes up to about $6.8 million in available funding for the rehabilitation project. And the gap to completion then runs at about $3.7 million, plus or minus a couple hundred thousand dollars, depending on how the math works. And this is the kind of work we're going to get very precise about working with city staff, depending on uh, Finance Committee direction tonight. Uh, I won't go deep into this because David already covered it, but uh, we have identified uh, library impact fees, community center impact fees, parks and recreation impact fees, as well as the Stanford Medical Center development fees. Somewhere in there, in that combination of impact fees, we feel there could be uh, some available funds or funds made available that do not impact the general fund. We understand, boy, do we understand the financial duress that the city is under right now. And we deeply respect that situation. We've had a lot of discussions with Kylie and David about this and Ed Shikata, and we're very sensitive to it. We understand that what we're asking for is not to impact essential city services. I'd like to point out that, the, that there's a precedent here. The city has invested in similar projects um, with uh, significant capital and operational support. Uh, the Junior Museum and Zoo, uh, the Art Center, and Avenidas. So I think that uh, working toward a funding scenario, creative funding scenario to rehabilitate the Roth building so that it can be occupied uh, seems to be supported from uh, past projects. So we really feel uh, moving ahead with the Palo Alto Museum in the Roth building is the fastest, most cost, of, cost effective way to restore this historic building. Uh, we have invested dearly to make the project shovel ready. We could start, uh, we could start construction with suitable funding in 30 days. We're, we're good to go. We've invested our dearly in the plans, permits, and fees. And so the Roth building rehabilitation utilizing the Palo Alto Museum plans is in fact shovel ready. It's one year and done. Uh, we feel that well, this is a one-time investment should the city make that investment. This is not an ongoing thing and it has nothing to do with the operations of the museum. We'll cover that with our own fundraising. I do wanna point out that as, as David brought up the cold shell option, we're not a big fan of the cold shell option because it's really complicated and it doesn't get us close enough to finishing the project in a timely fashion. It does have that added cost of about half a million dollars plus inflation. So this could get up to about 650 to $700,000 extra cost if we were to split the rehabilitation into multiple phases. And then there's complications with the release of established museum funds. Those donor funds can only go to the complete rehabilitation and eventually installation of the museum. And they must use the museum's plans to accomplish that. Uh, the museum plans need to be used in order to qualify the TDRs and county grants as well. Uh, so we just feel like that's, that's, a, that's a road that's gonna be a little bit challenging to navigate. I wanna share with you a quote from Steve Smith. Palo Alto is the stem cell of Silicon Valley, which has been home base for the most important evolution in the history of mankind, the technology industry. The Palo Alto stories of innovation and entrepreneurship that have led to valuable advances for the benefit of humanity 
are inspirational. The time to develop a world-class museum for Palo Alto is now. Steve Smith, longtime Palo Alto resident, uh, is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Computer History Museum, and he has pledged his support. In fact, he has pledged his support um, in the form of uh, sharing collections from the Computer History Museum itself. So it happened here. Palo Alto is an extraordinary city from Ray Clay Sr. Uh, to Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Lucy Stern, Frederick Terman, Joan Baez, Jerry Garcia, Steve Jobs, the list is long. And there's 10,000 more stories that we need to tell in this history museum. So uh, we think that, you know, we know we're sitting on a gold mine of historical treasure. And we really, really want to quickly shore up the Roth building so that we can get going with this history museum that this city so desperately um, deserves. Uh, the Computer History Museum, these are Palo, these are Palo Alto uh, supporting entities. Uh, some are rather significant. I wanna point out the Computer History Museum, the Museum of American Heritage, and the Stanford Library Special Collections and University Archives. In private conversations with the directors of each one of those institutions, I have gotten pledges of support. They feel like the History Museum in the Roth Building is absolutely essential to the cultural hub of Palo Alto, and they have pledged their collections to share with us. This is not trivial. Uh, the Stanford Libraries have huge collections up in Redwood City. MOA has the biggest collection of technology this side of the Smithsonian Institute and of course the Computer History Museum. A lot of community partnerships over the years, absolutely 100% behind this project. All of these partnerships want to see the museum installed in the Roth building. And uh, you can see the list, it's long, it's deep. We've got program collaborators, we have various endorsing uh, associations, corporate sponsors from Hewlett Packard to the Medal Palo Alto Medical Foundation, uh, youth education and youth program collaborators, and uh, exhibit and program col collaborators. So the tentacles of the History Museum run deep in this community. And I'm very, very happy to share with you, this is my final slide, um, we're, we're about to put out the press release on our new honorary chairs. These are very significant people and they have pledged their support to installing the History Museum in the Roth building and ongoing guidance. These are going to become our most important uh, volunteers. Now, Dr. Dean Clark has been a honorary chair for quite a few years. He, of course, is the son of Burge Clark, the architect of the building and the nephew of Dr. Esther Clark, one of the founding doctors of the Roth Building. Dr. Claiborne Carson, you may not know, Martin Luther King Jr. Centennial Professor of History Emeritus at Stanford University. Uh, Ronnie Lott, founding director emeritus of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute and senior fellow at the Freeman Sp Spoli Institute for International Studies. Dr. Gloria Hamm, who most of you know, retired history and Asian studies professor, former trustee of California State University and former member of the California State Board of Education. Dr. David M. Kennedy, who we're very happy to have on board, the Donald McLaughlin Professor of History Emeritus at Stanford University and former director of the Bill Lane Center for American West. And then last but certainly not least is Susan Packard Orr. Uh, CEO of Areva Software, trustee and former board chair of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, who have been incredibly supportive of the museum over the years, former trustee of Stanford University and a former Hewlett Packard board member. So I'll leave you with that. We'll, we're eager to get into discussions with all of you on any and all of these details. And coming up next, I'm going to stop sharing here. Coming up next is um, the extraordinary Hal Mickelson, uh, museum board member extraordinaire, who will um, uh, introduce us to some public speakers, if that's okay. 
Um, so let's see. Um, I uh, so we've been going on for a presentation for a bit, um, and uh, I think we should what we should do for the rest of the public speakers is just give everyone a chance to give uh, three minutes each. So Danny, do you want to just call people for public speakers and we just run through uh, people that raise their hands? Yes, of course. Um, if you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your hand in the app or press star nine. Um, we will start with Hal Michelson. I'll allow you to speak. And if you would also like to have your video shared, please let me know as well. Uh, thank you. Can you see me and hear me? Okay, let me see. Are you able to open your video now? We can hear you, Hal, but not see anything. Hello? Hal, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. And, and we, we can, can see you. you. Hal, you might be able to see me. Yes. Very good, thank you. It, there's a local school across the road that's a nice background for uh, historical discussions. My name is Hal Mickelson. Uh, I live in the Green Meadow area of uh, Palo Alto near Cupperley. Um, I'm gonna begin by sharing a statement from- uh, Actually, sorry, we've just sorry, talked sorry about... one, one second. Yes, I, I was just gonna ask Danny to put the timer up for you. Okay, sorry, uh, why don't you go ahead. Uh, I'm going to begin by sharing a statement uh, from a person who has just been mentioned, Susan Packard Orr, uh, who is one of the honorary chairs of the museum. Her family's foundation has so far contributed three quarters of a million dollars to support the museum. Uh, and these will be her words. She says, my parents were philanthropists long before they helped build one of the world's leading technology companies. The Packard Foundation was a national, a natural outgrowth of how we were raised to do our part to help others. Uh, and now with the third generation of our family engaged, I am proud of how the foundation continues to change the world for the better. I am pleased, she says, I am pleased that I serve as an honorary chair for the Palo Alto Museum. And I've recommended that our foundation support it as well. We are joined with the Hewlett family and with many other neighbors and friends who have helped to shape this community. Museums build empathy, understanding and compassion. Palo Alto and Stanford need their own history museum to tell the stories of the many diverse people whose creativity, integrity and public spirit have made this city unique. Please continue to support this important cultural area, this important cultural resource. Uh, I would like to read also a very short statement. It's edited to be concise. It, it's written by uh, Greer Stone. Uh, it was written in his capacity as the high school history teacher. This is what he has to say. For students to learn our city's history, they must study it independently. The best way to encourage this is to create an engaging, exciting, and beautiful museum that the city supports and celebrates. Our history, uh, both the good and the bad, must be seen and understood. The museum will ensure that our story is told a gift worth giving for our future. And finally, the last statement I'm going to read is from Gail Woolley, who is a past mayor and council member and a past president of the museum. She says, our city's achievements go back to the days when our municipal water system was established. Other institutions followed, including a community theater, a children's library and children's museum. In time, we became the heart of Silicon Valley. To capture this rich history, the Palo Alto Museum is planning dynamic, participatory exhibits, stories that will provide the inspiration for exploring and managing the next new things. Since 2007, numerous members of the city council and other dedicated representatives of the community have made significant investments of time and funds to provide a home for this endeavor. I implore you 
to push the project over the finish line. So we are grateful for those statements of support. I have uh, uh, four other people coming up who are eager to talk with you as well. They are John King, who's a leader in our real estate community, Jane Alhouse G, whom I think you all know. She's on the museum's advisory board. Dave Bubenik, uh, who will be talking for a few minutes about the technological and business history of Palo Alto. And uh, finally, David Kennedy, we've already talked about him uh, as uh, one of our honorary chairs, along with Susan Packard Orr. So uh, thank you all for the opportunity to present this information. Thanks to the city staff for their co cooperation. And uh, thanks to this committee's members for your uh, time and attention. Thanks very much. Great. And um, previously, you stated a list of names, uh, John King, Jane, then David Bubenik, and David Kennedy. Would you like to go in that order as well? Actually, can uh, we, just we can go the... in that order if they're yeah, available. Sorry. John King, are you on? Let's just follow the uh, process where everyone raises their hands up, and then Danny, you just call them. Including That's members great. Of the May I Anyone ask each of you to, to raise your hands, please? Great. Okay, I'll do that instead. Thank you. All right, next is David Bubenik. I'm going to allow you to speak. And would you also like to have your video shown as well? All right, I'll be a sport. <laughs> All right, great. I have promoted you and you should be able to turn on your video. I agree. Um, you're still muted. Okay, how's this? Yes. Perfect. Okay, I see myself too. Here we go. Uh, I'm David Bubenik. I live at 420 Homer Avenue, just one block from the Roth building. I've followed this process since it began in uh, 1997. Long time. I'd like to start with a uh, statement from uh, writer Wynne Win Wachhorst. Our city's decisive role began many decades before Steve Jobs moved to Waverly Street before William Shockley's work with transistors on San Antonio Road, before Robert Noyce designed integrated circuits on East Charleston, even before Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard's garage on Addison Avenue. Our legacy of innovation dates from 1912 when Lady Forrest developed the first practicable radio tube in a house on Emerson Street and thereby launched the electronic age. With a symbiotic connection to Stanford University, as well as ties to a long list of musicians, artists, writers, scientists, inventors, entrepreneurs, politicians, actors, and athletes, what a list. Palo Alto cries out for a state-of-the-art museum of local history. And now I'll cut over to a few words of my own as a uh, retired electrical engineer and 50-year resident of Palo Alto, I've been surprised at how few people realize of what Mr. Wachhorst just stated, that Palo Alto is the cradle of electronics itself. It was invented here. That is the event that ranks with the invention of the uh, printing press over 600 years ago in the history of human communication. Everything electronic and communications that we know of now dates back and began at that house at 913 Emerson in Palo Alto. We are truly an extraordinary place with an extraordinary history, and that needs to be exhibited. Following on that from Faith Bell of the renowned Bell's Books, our business, Palo Alto's oldest independent family owned bookstore, was founded during the Great Depression. We are asked repeatedly by visitors if there is somewhere they may learn about why our town has become such an internationally renowned hub of technology and culture. What is the magic that created this place? What did we learn? What must we remember? The museum's willingness to house the city archives and provide educational opportunities for our school children, residents, and visitors 
to provide community space and to design and maintain cutting edge displays and provide the perfect use for a historic building. Uh, we know what we need to do. Let's figure out a way to do it and let's do it. Thank you. Danny, uh, if you're trying to say something, you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so David Kennedy, I've um, unmuted you. If you would also like to have your video turned on. Um, please do. Please let me know. Great. I've promoted you, and you should be able to have your video on as well. So I'm now unmuted and uh, on camera? Yes. So thank you very much. So my name is David Kennedy. I'm a once upon a time Palo Alto resident, but I've lived on the Stanford campus for the last uh, several decades. And I've taught history at Stanford for the last 53 years. But despite that, I'm, I'm determined not to bore you with the usual cliches about the importance of history, things about how it's difficult to know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from. Or as President Harry Truman once said, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't already know. But I do want to share with you something that former Stanford President Donald Kennedy said on the morning of 18 October 1989, which was the morning after the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, the quake destroyed or badly damaged uh, many buildings on the Stanford campus and elsewhere, of course. Uh, among them on the campus, several century old structures that dated from the university's founding in the 19th century. And as Don stood uh, looking at the rubble in the quad that morning on 18 October 1989, a reporter asked him if Stanford intended to rebuild and restore the buildings that had been destroyed. And he gave a very simple and direct answer. He said, yes, of course we're going to rebuild because we don't have so much history that we can afford to lose any of it. We don't have so much history that we can afford to lose any of it. So I think that sentiment is applicable to your consideration of this facility in the Roth building and the creation of a Palo Alto History Museum. Palo Alto already has a rich history. It's reasonable to assume that in time going forward, a century from now, that history will be even richer. But if we don't step up now to preserve what we already have and to create and sustain a facility for recording what's yet to come, who then, a century hence, will know where they've come from or indeed, how will they even know who we were? So I wanna join others in urging you to support this facility and get it up and running as expeditiously as possible, thanks. Thank you. All right. Let's see, so next is going to be John King. Let me just first um, promote you. I've allowed you to speak. And would you like to turn your video on as well? Sure, yes. Great. OK, you should be able to turn on your video right now. Unmute and start. All right. So I, I've just started the video and I'm unmuted. I'll just, I don't see my video, but uh, maybe you do. We can so, see you. Okay, good. Um, so good evening, uh, Finance Committee. Uh, nice to be here with you this evening. Uh, uh, thanks for your time and all the effort that uh, you've been going through and uh, surviving through this uh a uh, number of months. I joined the board and I was honored to join the board of the museum a couple of years ago and uh, helped uh, facilitate uh, two large um, donations from the uh, one from continuing from the Packard Foundation and one from the Hewlett Foundation 
which showed the commitment of those types of uh, you know titans in the uh, technology arena here uh, as to their dedication and wanting to uh, see a museum be here uh, in town. But I'd like to read a few other quotes from uh, supporters of the museum that uh, been edited down a little bit, but from uh, Jim Wall, uh, board president of the Museum of American Heritage, uh, says a city as dynamic as Palo Alto should be able to showcase its contributions to the world. History Museum will be a destination for every family in the area, an outing for school groups of all ages, and a must-see location for visitors to our community. It also will provide a focused organization that can be responsible for pre preservation and display of historic documents, photographs, and artifacts. Another supporter, uh, Deborah Shepard, uh, member of County Historical Heritage Commission, says uh, Palo Alto has a remarkable history. It begins with the Wild West, agriculture, manufacturing, and the creation of Stanford University moves on to innovation in electronics, medicine, and computer science in the era of rock and roll. Its stories can inspire both newcomers and long time residents and encourage future innovation, pride, and investment in our community. The work of architect Burge Clark has helped define the character of Palo Alto. The Roth building is among his most significant achievements. It's also a milestone in the history of healthcare. The county has made a significant investment in repairs for its historic red tile roof. The museum will provide by far the most appropriate reuse of this important and historic building. Uh, from Palo Alto residents, uh, resident Ray Hua Pan said, when we came to Palo Alto in 1977 to attend Stanford Business School, we were discouraged from looking at houses north of Oregon Expressway because I was Chinese. And there's a longer little version of that. So I see my timing is done. But uh, the last quote is from Barty Wallace, uh, who's also a very long time supporter and whose family took roots in 19, uh, excuse me, 1895 in the uh, town's early development. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right. And we have one more speaker who has their hand raised, and that's Jane Gee. I'm going to allow you to speak. And would you like to also have your video turned on? Uh, sure, that would be fine. Great. I've promoted you as panelists, and you should be able to turn on your video now. Okay. All right. Can you see me? Not yet. What do I do? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. All right. And yes, there, you are. there we go. Great. All right. Great. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jane Allhouse G, and um, my husband and I live at 1305 Greenwood Avenue in Palo Alto near the community center. I grew up here in Palo Alto and uh, I was on the board of the History Museum uh, for about four years and I am currently on the advisory board. So um, I've, I'm very happy to read three comments from uh, three different individuals that you'll recognize, I'm sure. And um, I'd like to start out with um, uh, a comment from Annette Evans Fazzino. Um, her husband, Gary Fazzino, yielded to no one in his ardent love for Palo Alto and its history. Annette writes, understanding history makes us better. Palo Alto's history is rich and diverse. A city of merely 65,000 people, our hometown is known throughout the world. We need to share our citizens, our children and visitors, all of the wonderful things that have happened here. By sharing our history, we build our community and open a path for the next generation to continue to be leaders and innovators. Uh, the second person um, I'm going to read a, a quote from is uh, Greg Smith, a past Palo Alto vice president and council member. 
Palo Alto has long been a leader on many fronts. We have taken initiatives to help our region by providing a well-educated labor force, making critical contributions to path-breaking enterprises and leading a wide range of environmental endeavors, including protection of open space. We cannot rely on word of mouth to build on these traditions. The Palo Alto Museum at the Roth Building will bring us education, research, archives, exhibits, and frankly, a necessary focus that the city must support to show our values. As an economist and former council member, I understand all too well the pressure of budget constraints, but I urge you to find the funds to join me and my friends and neighbors in supporting the community's culture and pride through the Palo Alto Museum. It is a project that is ready to go. It is a project whose potential we are not likely to attain in any other way. My final quote is from Dr. Laura Jones, Director of Heritage Services at Stanford University. Local archives and museums are the bedrock on which the practice of history making depends. The Palo Alto Museum will be an essential hub of community building in a time of uncertainty when we need anchors, stories, and inspiration. The muse museum is the best program fit for the historic Roth building, respectful, community-centered, outward facing. Am I out of time or can I finish this? <laughs> the museum team has demonstrated that it can get this done slowly but steadily, carefully and with great heart. Please respect the years of commitment demonstrated by the friends of this project and offer your continuing support. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate all the work that's gone in on into this. Okay, thank you, uh, members of the public and staff and uh, folks from the History Museum. Um, so I'm closing um, public comment at this point and taking back to the Finance Committee. Um, so let's, um, let's begin the discussion. Um, uh, Councilmember Nis, Vice Mayor, either of you guys have any comments, questions, motions? Thoughts about this? Uh, Liz, you're muted. Could I jump in, Greg? Please, go ahead. Unless you want to go ahead, Tom. Let's go ahead. OK, just to explain to people who are here, who have been talking tonight and so forth, we're the Finance Committee. Our job tonight is to look at what you have requested um, and to make a recommendation back to the council I don't know when this will be heard again, whether it's in December or January, but um, let's plow ahead. So I've actually been involved in this for a very long time. Um, some of you know that, some of you don't. But I, I wanted to ask some questions and I think perhaps we'll do well if we do a maybe a round robin of questions tonight and see where we're actually headed. So I'm, I'm looking at, I think, um, who wants to answer questions? Is it you, Richard, or Laura? Okay, Richard. Okay, you need to turn off your mute. <laughs> We're all available to answer questions. I'll take the lead. Okay, that's what I needed to know. So you're looking for, um, you know, I, I feel a little like Shark Tank tonight. You know, you know what, what amount are you actually looking for? It looks to me as though you're actually looking for something in the, uh, I'd say kind of in the ballpark of 10 million total, am I correct? No, the balance to finish the rehabilitation project is about 4 million. Um, Council Member Nis, if you would look on um, page nine of the staff report, uh -huh. um, you can kind of see the three different buckets of funding uh, all going towards that $10.5 million, $10 million total rehabilitation estimate uh, in terms of cost. And so um, what Richard's talking about is, you know, readily available funds are about six of that 10.5, meaning that that's a gap of 4.5. If we move down into pledges, um, depending on the numbers that you use, uh, that narrows that gap to four to 4.3. Uh, and then if the council, if the finance committee wants to recommend to council um, that the city provide additional funding, 
um, it would be kind of that 4.5 4 to 4.5 million dollar gap. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yes, and and so does that make sense to you, Richard? That's why I came up with the ten the ten million. So. So the question would be, and so now um, if I could talk with uh, Ms. Jose, who is our CFO for a minute at the same time, and ask her um, the sort of million dollar question is, where do we get the 4.2 million or whatever it is that we would end up going, going forward with? And before you answer that, let me, uh, let me frame this by saying, this has been, as you all know, a really hell of a year. This has been from the time COVID hit in, on March 17th. And then we looked at a budget that was just um, so stupefying in June and one that we will be continuing to look at that provides services of all types throughout the city, as you all know. So when we're looking at something like this. And believe me, as a council member, there's nothing you like more than giving away money. That's, that's, it's really a given. So, but in this case, let's talk about where would we actually find that? So Kylie, would you be kind enough to go through that and what, what it means? Um, somebody, somebody will get it and somebody will not get it. Uh, let me take a stab at it. And obviously we've got a team of people here. So as I'm missing points, feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, uh, actually, sorry, as you go through this, do you mind bring up the slide number, um, slide number uh, seven, so, so that it's easy for uh, our council members and the public to follow along? Sure, David is gonna do that for us. I will do that, thank you. Um, and for the public, it's, uh, we're still gonna look at page nine of the staff report. Um, so, uh, continuing down that table, it's really the bottom component of it. We kind of tried on the left-hand side to show the different types of funding. Uh, if the council, if the finance committee wants to recommend to the council that the that staff come back with additional financial support um, to round out anything from a cold shell to the full rehabilitation, we've kind of outlined the three major types of funding that would be where we would go. Um, the first is additional city impact fees, um, and it's about 600000 These are rough estimates based on the square footage of the facility and the uses that um, Mr. Green had presented in terms of the square footage of the facility uh, and potential eligible impact fee funds. Remember, impact fee funds are highly restricted um, and can only be used for improvements. They are not able to be or eligible to be used for operating or um, ongoing services. So uh, that 600,000 is uh, primarily uh, impact fees associated with parks um, and specifically would be for the restroom uh, that would be managed and maintained by the city uh, and ultimately available to the public um, and obviously patrons of the uh, heritage park area um, out there. So those would be funds that are, to be honest, not allocated in our five-year CIP. Uh, therefore, uh, there isn't necessarily an already council approved planned project, uh, but obviously any, you know, dedication of these funds would mean um, a change in our funding ability to do other projects. So an example, if we wanted to talk about the trade offs that the council is facing, uh, if we were to invest 300,000 or so in a public restroom here in Heritage Park, uh, these also would be a funding source for any kind of capital improvements associated with, say, Foothills Park. Um, and as the council is managing and understanding and learning uh, what Foothills Park and the reopening of that might be, that would also be an eligible, a potential eligible use um, for funds like this. Once you move past that, you're actually moving into funds that are already allocated for the most part to projects that council has approved in their five-year CIP. Um, and it would require us to reprioritize or delay or defer those projects until additional impact fees were available. Um, so where I will point the council and the public to next is actually on page um, 11 of the staff report where we actually identify each of the impact fees. So this is community center, library, as well as parks and the amount of funds that are eligible 
uh, versus the funds that are available. And if there are projects that would be impacted by the reallocation of these funds, uh, they're all listed on the far right. So for example, the community center uh, only has about $100,000 that is available, meaning it's not allocated to an existing council approved project. However, there is a probably based on square footage percentage about 2 million to 0.3 million that might be eligible for this project. Uh, however, in order to fund that level, we would need the council to rescope or readjust um, the Rinconada Improvements Capital uh, Project because those funds right now are planned for the Rinconada Improvements Capital Project, uh, which is, coincides with the JMZ upgrade. So uh, I don't know if you want me to go through each of these, but those are the trade-offs, so to speak, in terms of the impact fees and the projects that they're currently allocated towards. Um, the last category are SUMC funds or general funds. Um, SUMC, there is about 3 million, a little less than 3 million that's unallocated in the community health and safety. Um, so there isn't necessarily an identified project uh, that the council has taken action to dedicate these funds towards. Previously, uh, balances in this account were used for project safety net, and it's a policy call for council on how they would wish to allocate these one-time resources. Um, and then obviously general fund, whether it be operating or capital, um, is fully programmed out, as you mentioned, in terms of all of the significant, frankly, reductions uh, that we took both in the operating and capital side. So uh, I can honestly say any allocation of funds from either general fund operating or general capital improvement fund will require um, changes in services or in capital improvement program um, planned projects. Uh, and at this point, we are hitting, given the budget reductions we've done, as outlined on the staff report, trying to walk everybody through it publicly um, on page 12, you know, we are really into kind of our keep up, uh, catch up and keep up type of capital projects. So other than a couple key projects like um, Birch Street uh, and that park and the new park that we acquired, uh, and the building out of that, we are moving into building system improvements, um, roof replacements, waterproofing, streets and sidewalk maintenance. And so it's those kind of um, programs or projects in our CIP that we would need to look at, um, frankly, pulling funding from to identify and reallocate towards this project. So hopefully that's a high level walkthrough as, as the committee has more questions. Happy to, to dive into it further. That's extremely helpful. Um, what I always realize is if we were making these changes tonight, those people who are um, supportive of the, of the money that they would anticipate getting would be here asking um, you know, why it's going someplace else. But um, where are you again, Richard? I know you're here somewhere. He is right there. <laughs> I don't see him yet, but the next question would be, Let's say we sam somehow came up with this magic uh, number of, of 10 million. What is the next step after that? And um, how will you get from there to what I think is going to be the, the literally rest of the project where you have to actually put in, into that what you described to us in great detail tonight, which is essentially to furnish if that's the right word, um, I'm not sure what the correct word would be to finish to, to finish the museum. But it would help to know, um, since it's been difficult to raise money for this, it's been hard, it's been a hard slog, would you agree? Um, how would you start? Well, once the rehabilitation project is funded, then Vance Brown Construction kicks into gear. Uh, they are ready. Now, they'd have to corral their subcontractors, um, but uh, the estimate is for about a one-year construction project, and that would do all of the, the, the new roof, the seismic upgrades, the new bathrooms. Basically, they would build out the museum's architectural plans. Uh, so we're figuring about one year for that. Uh, we have to watch out for the spring rains, of course, uh, if, if the roof comes off. And then during that period, running in parallel, the History Museum will be 
designing and getting ready to build the exhibits. So after that first year of construction, we will start installing the museum. Now the museum total build out is estimated to be about $8 million. And we don't have the full $8 million yet. We have about two and a half million toward that goal, which is enough for us to get started with the essential components of the building. And we're going to prioritize the community access aspects of it. So the, the Leonard and Shirley Ely entry lobby, the community room at the back, the cafe, the boardroom, the uh, city archives up on the second floor, those would all be open to the public and ready for use uh, shortly after the construction project. And then as our fundraising continues, we would build out the exhibits, the galleries, permanent as well as rotating, as well as start to initiate the education programs, coordinating with Palo Alto Unified School District and so on. So it's an unfolding process that starts right away as soon as we have occupancy. Okay, thank you. Okay, enough, enough um, of my questions for now. Let me turn it back to you, Chair. Okay, um, uh, Vice Mayor, do you have any questions, comments, thoughts on this? Uh, sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to all the speakers tonight. I think you, you said things very well. And um, the list of the honorary chairs was was impressive. Um, also, I, I need to apologize up front. The uh, council meeting last night ended at about 1.45 a.m. Um, I had to get up at 3.30 a.m. for a trip to the East Coast. So I'm on the East Coast. And um, given my schedule tomorrow, I, I'm going to have to leave after this item is over. I'm just, uh, and I hope I can be coherent for this item. <laughs> I got very little sleep. I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> um, a couple of questions. So on the staff presentation, what happened in to the 2005, the 40 year lease? Uh, you said something like it was never formally executed. Uh, what happened after council approved that in 2005? So um, the, it, it, as you noted in 2005, there was um, a lease option approved uh, by council. I think it was actually 2007 when it formally went to the city council. Um, the lease option, if um, exercised, which it was not, um, would have triggered, uh, if all uh, requirements in the lease option had been met um, and the lease option had been exercised, that would have uh, then triggered the lease coming back to the city council for the lease then to be approved. Um, the, le the lease option was the, the requirements and the lease option, uh, primarily being the fundraising component, were never formally met. And so the lease option was never formally exercised. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and then I had some questions related to Heritage Park. We got some letters from members of the public. Um, there were, there were a couple of issues, it looked like. So first of all, is the Roth building on dedicated parkland or is it outside of the park? So the Roth building is technically outside of the park. Um, we have, um, through um, the requirements of the Santa Clara County grant program, historic grant program, which we received funding for, in first in 2019 and then recently again additional funding so you've probably seen it recently um, we have um, stipulated that uh, through a resolution that the city council approved in 2019 that it would be kept open that the roth building would be kept open as a park um, so that's the caveat to um, it not formally being on dedicated parkland but it needs to operate as a park to, to continue to receive the city County of Santa Clara grant funding. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think that's what one of the members of the public was writing about that um, I guess he was unclear how we were accepting those county funds without saying it was a park and that we had other places where we were leasing the land where the park was temporary, but since we own the land, how is it a temporary park? <laughs> so so um, Councilmember Du Bois, the county is aware that we have not dedicated this as parkland under Palo Alto's special park dedication definition. And they're satisfied with how we're handling the property and that we do qualify for these grant funds, these county grant funds. So there isn't, 
the answer to the member of the public is there isn't one sort of holy grail definition of what is a park. And we're in a situation where this is not a dedicated parkland for Palo Alto purposes, but it is enough of a park for the county that would qualify for these funds. And do we have to move forward with the museum to use those funds? Are those funds for the city's historic building regardless? No, my understanding is that we, we do need to move forward. Um, last time I looked at this, um, which was the prior time. Um, David, do you know the answer to that? Will we need to unwind this grant if we in fact don't move forward with, in, with this disposition of the building? As presently uh, written, the grant agreement includes uh, the History Museum. Um, and we were joint applicants with the History Museum on these grants. Okay. And then there was a mention about the bathroom being operated by the city. Um, didn't environmental uh, partners build the bathroom at the Sea Scout building? And do they operate that or do we operate that? I mean, is that unusual that the city would uh, operate that bathroom ongoing or is that also a normal process um, I actually am not aware of the agreement at the Seascout building I would need to go research that um, I would say that it's not unusual for the city to operate park um, restroom facilities uh, we do have restrooms at other parks uh, I'm not quite sure on shared use parks uh, we need to do a yeah I, the Sea Scout was similar they sold TDRs there was a commitment to build a bathroom as part of that project. That's why it's not like, uh, yeah, if the city builds a bathroom in a park, of course we operate it, but uh, okay. Um, and then on the TDR funds, what are those eligible to be used for? So again, are those tied to the museum or are they tied to the building itself? So I'll take a stab at that. Um, they, 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 um, our, our city funds, meaning, um, let me just sort of start with the, the, your last uh, maybe question of, of that. Um, if the city were to um, pursue another option, um, not with the Palo Alto Museum, I'm just putting that out there hypothetically, uh, the TDR funds could um, conceivably go for um, another project at the Roth building. So um, they, they are tied to the Roth building. Um, but they are not, um, they are not tied um, exclusively uh, to the plans that were submitted um, by the Palo Alto Museum. Uh, so, um, but as we have the plans presently approved and there's a building permit approved with the Palo Alto Museum plans, the TDRs presently would go towards um, those plans. But if the city were to completely uh, change course, and go with a different partner, uh, the TER funds could go theoretically to a different project. I'll just it, add, it have to be I would just say, I'll add, uh -huh, exactly. Let yeah. me add that last piece, which is the reason why the current PAM plans are, you know, the TDRs work for it is because the PAM plans meet certain historic resource um, requirements. And so those TDRs do have to go to a project that meet those requirements. Uh, so it would require, you know, if someone wanted to make the investment to do additional or an alternative set of plans that met those um, right. legal regulations, that's um, there. Uh, but right. again, just there are restrictions. It's not just the, the tie between the two partnerships. Okay, so out of this kind of $10 million total, we have fees that, uh, like the grants that the museum has, has co-authored with the city that are tied to the museum. We have TDRs that are tied to historical preservation. And then we have this kind of 4 million gap and kind of round numbers. Um, um, and then we have these, the SUMEC funds, $3 million potentially there, hearing, you know, that there's always trade-offs. Um, so what I'm hearing, and I think, I think what's being offered here is you know, the museum is offering the ability to leverage city funds by investing some city money. And I think the question for the council is, you know, do we attract private donors and end up with something much larger than the city would get on its own? You know, this is our building. Um, it's deteriorating. If we had to incur the entire $10 million from other sources, 
would we end up with as many benefits? Would we end up with the bathroom? Would we end up with a community room? Um, you know, we've done this before, you know, working with partners over time. You know, the, the Junior Museum is a good example. I think Avenidas is an example. Um, you know, taking a city owned building, working over decades really um, to become well established. Um, so, me, it's, for me, it's really an issue of time, the health of the building, these benefits. Um, I do like the value of kind of having a mini museum district here. Um, you know, and I think the other thing that we would need to consider is uh, it's been brought up before is, you know, uh, these city owned archives, they need a home. You know, what would we incur putting them somewhere else or what do we do with them? Um, and, you know, when I think about other recent opportunities like the post office, you know, the total price actually seems pretty, pretty reasonable, you know, compared to other projects we've looked at. Um, so, and I also think that without a lease, the, the, I understand, I, I mean, it seems like it'd be very difficult to raise money if you were the museum with no building, no lease. Um, and, um, you know, so, you know, I know we're, re we're reviewing our capital project uh, plan uh, very soon, I think in a couple of weeks. Um, but for me, I'd like to see this come to council. Um, you know, I do think we need to consider uh, a long-term lease that would enable them to raise money. Um, that would include terms for the public bathroom and a community meeting room. Um, we would challenge staff to go identify funding. I think we've come up with an initial list. I think after we kind of review our infrastructure plan, um, you know, we kind of see where we are. Um, and again, I think the request to be able to sublet to either a for-profit or non-profit uh, makes sense. Uh, that was the first time I saw maybe those updated plans for the specific uses of the first floor and the second floor. Um, and then I think the last point, um, which I think Rich made, um, is, you know, if we do move forward financially, I think we also need to move forward spiritually and really have the city and the museum work in partnership and not just through money, but through our actions and, and demonstrated support kind of make this project happen. Um, it, it's, we've kind of been ha half in, half out, and I think it's time we either we're either all in or all out. So that's kind of where I am. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, so let me ask a few questions here. Uh, where exactly are our library archives right now? The staff know? Where are we storing them? I could answer that. This is Laura. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, oh. They're at the Coverly Center in, I believe it's room K9 back by the tennis court. So it's a couple of old elementary school classrooms, which are painfully familiar to those of us at a certain age. We all went to school there. There's no climate control. Uh, you can open windows, but um, it's a completely, it's a great place for it to be rather than being in someone's garage, but it's not much better than that. From a museum and archives perspective, what you want to preserve those materials is much more close to a wine cellar setting with climate control and humidity control. And none of that exists for these archival materials, which have been collected over a hundred years. Okay, so um, in the new new plan, it would, it would be cared for better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, and then um, can staff tell me how many years has this building been vacant, the Roth building roughly? Well, we bought it in 2000, and I don't know that anyone has inhabited it since. So, um, so is I've, it fair to say that it's been 20 years that this building has been vacant? Uh, yeah. OK. I believe and, so, but I, I'll leave those that are okay. on the call that have more history than I do to correct. That's fine. OK, so, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's been vacant for 20 years. Um, and the rough square footage total of the building is what, again, in terms of total square footage? Can, can staff tell me? It's 20,000. Okay, about 20,000 square feet, okay. And um, uh, now this is kind of like a downtown kind of building, right? So 
anyone know what rent goes downtown these days, roughly? Anyone? Um, just it is in SOFA. Um, and also one thing to consider is the parking requirements associated. Yeah, of course. So it's not a fair comparison, but you know, I hear properties in that area, a monthly rent going from five to ten dollars. This probably wouldn't go for ten dollars, probably wouldn't go for five either, but who knows, right? But um, but yeah, you take twenty thousand square feet, um, and your times it by. Um, let's just be conservative. Let's say five dollars. Um, that's uh, one hundred thousand dollars a month, and this has been vacant for twenty years, for twelve and just twelve months in a year. So that's one hundred thousand times um, times twenty years times twelve months. So so basically. For 20 years, um, if it's assuming a $5 a month rent, which, you know, this assumption, that's $24 million over the course of 20 years that this building has been, that's lost opportunity, right, for the city that this building has been vacant for, for two decades, right? Um, you know, I was talking to um, our colleagues in Malview, uh, to the mayor of Malview, and I asked her, like, how, how's your city budget doing? And she says, we're actually pretty good, you know, COVID and all that stuff, we're all actually pretty good. And last, and I was like, how can that be? Like we, just, we like in Palo Alto, we got hammered, right? How, how the heck are you guys doing okay? And she says, well, you know, we have all that property along Shoreline. Um, we rent it to Google, we, we rent it out to all these, all these companies and we get steady rent for it. And so, you know, one of the big revenue drivers of, of Mountain View and the reason why they haven't really been hit by this, by this COVID recession is because they rent out city property. Um, and they rent it out at fair market rate and they make a lot of money from it. Um, and so I just, you know, at a time right this year, as um, Councilmember Nis said, it's been a pretty devastating year financially. Hotels, you know, we're at like 5% occupancy. Our, um, our sales taxes have been pummeled, right? Um, a lot of people lost their jobs, a lot of people taking pay cuts. Um, and so just think about it. We, we've had a building for 20 years that we left vacant. That you know, I, I don't. And five dollars has been conservative. I I would could argue that it could probably be rented for more. But you know, this is just like taking a rough swag here. But that's that's twenty four million dollars. A lot of money. You know, that's that's a lot of things I could have paid for, right? We we cut our 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 crosstown shuttle. We we cut what three two three million dollars from the our school district. Um, we laid off employees, including firefighters. Um, so I, I, I do think we have to think about, um, think about that as we, um, consider this project here. Um, and, um, okay. So I just wanted to kind of frame it in terms of what, what has been going on for 20 years, uh, with this building, which is unfortunately nothing. Um, and so, um, okay. And so for the museum, how, how long, and I don't know if anyone here can tell me, but how long has this museum been trying to raise? enough money to fund the museum. Can anyone tell me like how long it's been? Like how many years has it been? Well, the clock starts when we had a signed lease option agreement with the city. Okay, so actually I wanna stop you on that. So Molly, can you tell me, um, <clears throat> I, I, are, are, can fundraising really only occur when there's a lease agreement. I, I guess why is that? Because I've I've seen, and I've contributed to projects that have had no lease projects, no lease agreement, and have raised money. And I guess I just want to understand why why in this case is a a lease agreement needed to raise or to get commitments for the museum. What, what's 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 the legal requirement behind that? There's there's no legal restriction on fundraising. Okay. Um, it, I, I think it's a practical issue, and so the museum people would be in a better position to speak to. Them. Okay, no problem. So when did this museum could, project, sorry, I just want to ask, when did I the, could. sorry, Laura, I'll call on you um, when, when I need an answer. Right. Um, so, um, so when, when um, I've, been, I've been hearing this about this museum for a long time, I forgot how long, but it's a long time. Can anyone remind me when, what was the year that we started, like this started forth, was it 2005 or when, when was it? Does anyone, anyone remember how long it's been? So, 2007. 2000, 
Yeah, let me just add a little bit um, uh, prior details to that. In 2002, the city council approved an RFP to go yeah. out for looking at Roth building options. And the Powell at the History Museum um, submitted their RFP in 2003, and then it was accepted in 2005. So, okay, so let's just say 2005. So, for 15 years, um, um, uh, the Powell History Museum has been trying to raise funds for 15 years, right? Maybe you could argue maybe before, maybe you could, rent, you could argue later, and maybe you could argue, well, gee, we need to have this 40 year lease agreement in order to raise money. But I've, I've seen other projects, other you know, really, really worthwhile projects like this, raise money and have a lot less time without a lease agreement. So I guess I'm, 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 I'm hearing the lease agreement might make a difference, but I'm also very concerned about, um, about um, you know, like, I, I think if, 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 if the museum had already raised the money right now, right, if all that, I think, um, let's put, put, put aside the 4 million, but um, back to Council Member Nissa's question. So we have $2.5 million raised, and I think there's some question, at least from what I saw from staff on this, but let's just say it's $2.5 million raised. Let's say, it kind of, is, that, is that correct or am I, am I off on this? How much, how much have they raised? Uh, I think the, the museum would be better suited to- Okay, right, let's just use the numbers that I heard from Rich. So 2.5 million, um, and there's $8 million left to finish, plus the $4 million extra, right? So that means that there's like, Anyways, I guess my, my point is, is it's been 15 years, there's still like a massive gap in funding here. And, and that, that concerns me because um, every year that goes by, there's lost opportunity costs, there's lost revenue that we're not getting from this building. There's, there's a use for this building. It's in the, the real estate wise, it's in a great location, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's in a great location in the city, it can benefit a lot of people, but it's, it's, it's another, another year goes by is another year that this property is not being used, that we're not getting revenue for, for the community is not benefiting from, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about, um, about the, um, how, how, how tough it's been. And, and I, I, um, I mean, how tough it's been to raise money for this project. And, and, and so, you know, as stewards of the city, I think it's important for us to consider that and think about how do we do what, what do we do and i i remember we we've had this council discussion on council several times about you know let's extend the deadline let's try to you know try to help them out and and i think we've done that and but here we sit and it's still there's a massive massive gap i mean it's I'm just using the numbers so those so there's eight million dollars to finish it plus another firm is that's 12 million dollars minus let's say this let's say the museum is able to to collect on a 2.5 commitment, that's that's like 9.5 million dollars. Like, there's still a 9.5 million dollar gap. Now we could talk about the four million dollars, um, and maybe maybe it's good if staff could bring up slide six or seven. I guess uh, maybe seven's better. But okay, so let's 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 say uh, can staff bring up slide uh, seven, please? Yeah, I'll work on that. Okay, so um, so let's let's talk about um, so there's like a ask for another four million dollars or so, four point five I guess, um, to take money away from other 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 priorities in our city for this, right? So let's let's go through each one of these one by one here. So um, so okay, maybe maybe let's start off with. Um, Reconada, right? So staff has said, well, to do this, to fill this gap, we would have to defund Reconada, which is um, also kind of coinciding with the JMZ um, upgrade that we're doing there. Um, can staff talk about what does that mean? So we, when we take money away from the Reconada JMZ project, what does that mean for that project? Perhaps we should ask uh, Kristen, okay, to describe, or Brad, yes, either of you, I think, jump in. Uh, I, I'd be happy to take a shot from my perspective. Brad Eggleston, Director of Public Works. Uh, so the, the current funding for the Rincon Auto Park project supports the, uh, the agreement with the Friends of the JMZ and the new JMZ. And it's primarily focused on um, relocating uh, some existing playgrounds that are uh, 
kind of uh, past their useful life and needing to be replaced. And also uh, creating a new entrance way into the park that corresponds to um, the JMZ and, and the, the parking lot, new parking lot that's next to the Girl Scout house. And then one other aspect, there's some very old um, pathways in the park that work on them has been deferred uh, for about 10 years, kind of in anticipation of the JMZ projects that really need to be replaced. So it's, it sounds like a fairly significant part of the project. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the JMZ program, they were able to raise enough funds and the thing is fully funded. Unless of course we take the money away from this and put it to the history museum. Is that correct or am I mistaken? Uh, pro Kristen probably knows the details, but I do know that it was a jointly funded project, um, though I do believe the majority of it was uh, donor supported. Uh, well, I mean, my point was donor, but they, they actually raised it though. They actually raised the funds and they actually, and that's why they're able to move forward. But that's my understanding. But Kristen, maybe you could correct me if I'm mistaken here. Um, that's right. So um, the friends of the Junior Museum and Zoo, they were able to fundraise about $20 million of the overall project. The city did have a contribution of, I believe, um, and Kylie, maybe you can correct me this on $8 million. That was about eight. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. just, just for a point of reference, how long did it take the GMZ to raise their portion of the funds? Do you have any idea? This is as a, as a point of reference for, for this, our discussion here tonight. Do you it, was a, it was a few years. Um, I don't know the exact um, start and end date of that, but it, it did take a few years to raise that. And I'd like to remind you that one of one donor gave 15 million of that 20 million. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, I, I guess I, I, but I don't think it took 15 years for that, did it? I don't think so. No. Yeah, it wasn't 15 years. Can someone mute their mic? Um, okay. Um, okay. Let's, let's talk about the next thing. Okay. All so, right. um, that was a, this is Tim Stitt. Sorry. I don't know who's talking. <laughs> so, so Tim is on the, um, board of the junior museum and zoo. So I think he was, um, oh, oh, I see. trying Thank to provide you. more info. Maybe, um, maybe just so we don't have, uh, interruptions. I don't know, Danny, can you mute everyone else that's not on the video right now? And then yes, of course. Could... And, and, and maybe you can just unmute them when, when I call on them. Okay, um, let's go over the next, uh, next thing that we would have to defund. Um, so um, the library automated material handling, which I think is to automate the check-in of library materials at small library branches, increase efficiency. And I think this was actually an important project to, um, well, maybe staff can you tell us what is the impact of, let's say we defund they fund the, library, the automated library material handling. What is, it, what is the impact on our operations um, and, and the hours and the ability to service our, our patrons to these libraries? What is the impact of that if we defund that? So uh, we do have Gayatri Kant on the line, our uh, interim library services director. Um, and obviously this has to do with the shift um, and realignment of our kind of library hubs versus neighborhood libraries um, that we approved as part of the budget process. I thought Thank I said you. on here. Are you able to unmute yourself? Or Danny, she may, oh, there we go. There we go. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, um, Kali um, gave um, a good uh, overview of the project. What it does is um, enable us to check instead of hand checking every item right now in the small branches. Um, that includes children's library, which is about 15% of our circulation. So you're talking about um, 180,000 items a year that are hand checked um, by getting an AMH installed, they would be automatically checked in. So if, if you didn't have this, right, let's say we defunded it and put it to the History Museum, what is the impact to your operations? How does that affect, you know, your cost, your ability to service, especially during COVID? How does the ability, ability affect your organization's ability to uh, properly service the community? So in the children's library setting, um, we actually reduced our um, 
staffing about by about 50 to 60 percent, anticipating that this would help us to get through that. Without funding, this particular funding, then we would really have to, it's already, um, we just have three days of operation scheduled. Um, without this, I think it would be very difficult to open the library. I see. Okay. So, so by doing this, you're saying that we may, we may have to potentially either significantly reduce the number of hours that a library is open or not have library open at all in order to fund the history museum. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And, and I would imagine with COVID that's gotta be even more, more tough, right? <laughs> because you're more constrained, but um, okay. I understand. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your insights on that. Um, okay, and then let's move on to the next thing that we would have to defund. Um, so, um, so the SUMC, um, the um, the uh, so in the pet, in pet, I think so. This has to be used for health um, health services, and I think in the past this has been used for Project Safety Net, which I think has been a pretty important program in our community. Um, can staff talk about? So let's say we were to fund this, what would the impact be? Can, can anyone talk about that? Um, you know, these are development funds. Uh, so there was a development agreement with Stanford University uh, mm -hmm. as part of the medical center um, build out. Um, so these are not impact fees. These are uh, part of a separate agreement. However, yes, there were um, priorities, I would say, that were outlined as part of that agreement in different buckets um, for investment uh, associated with the impacts of um, the medical center. Uh, these funds are not yet allocated. Um, so the council has not taken formal action on what project they would like to dedicate them towards. Uh, we just provided the context that previously funds in this bucket were used for Project Safety Net. Obviously, we've changed our service delivery model for Project Safety Net at this point. Um, so ultimately, it is a council um, decision on how and where to allocate these funds. Um, okay. I think areas that we've talked about uh, before, but obviously have not settled on, things like if we wanted to invest in you know, health and wellness it, facilities like community centers, such as Coverly, or we've also talked about, um, there's one uh, piece that's associated with infrastructure. We've talked about using that for potentially grade separation or um, work on that. Uh, but again, council, these are at council's discretion. Okay. Um, and so I would assume, assume at this point in time, Project Safety Net does not need this money at all. Is that right? I'm sure if you ask Project Safety Net, they would be happy to receive these funds as an endowment uh, to help fund their ongoing work. Um, that is a question I think for them and a priority in terms of a council designation. Um, they are not pledged to them though, no. Okay, okay. Um, and they're not expecting it and they, they've not gotten funding from us before. Um, um, is that is that actually they have project safety net yeah. you're referring to yes project safety net has been funded by the city and is currently uh, working on a transition to become financially self-sustaining but okay. that's it, they're not quite there yet okay so if we took away this money would project safety net be endangered then not necessarily how we are currently funding or supporting financial or project safety net financially is through the general fund um a, I believe we provide about a hundred thousand dollar annual subsidy to them uh, mm -hmm. as they go through this transition period. Um, it's quite a bit less. Like we've been working on this transition for. A I'm sorry. Of years. That's quite a bit less than we had been. We've been working on this transition right. for several mm -hmm. years, right? That's correct. Uh, you know, these funds used to be used for um, the monitoring of the cameras at the um, grade crossings. Uh, that's now funded out of the general fund. Uh, and these funds were also used for um, actual project safety net administration to the tune of, you know, 200 plus thousand dollars a year. Um, but again, services have changed. Uh, a lot of these funding sources have moved into the general fund or are spinning off into a new model um, and, and working their way through becoming financially independent. Okay, okay. Um, but it, it sounds like um, from the same manager said, there's still some help needed how much help, I guess we don't necessarily know at this very moment, but some help's needed. Um, and can someone remind us what is, in terms of the service that Project Safety Net provides the city? It's like 
suicide prevention, right? Yes. Right. Um, which I, I think. Awareness. Yes. Yeah, I think that's been something that I think has been the value for our community. Okay, so that's something. Um, could um, you know we have this COVID situation going on right now? Um, could the funds be used to help with you know testing facilities or being things that could help us with the recovery? Uh, because I think aren't the funds kind of earmarked for um, like health services type of uses? The fund, the fund definition is community-based health and wellness programs that benefit residents of the city. Yeah, so could certainly it be... uh, virus testing and recovery would qualify. Okay, I mean that to me seems like a really critical thing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, but it seems like this is like the number one priority in the city is the COVID recovery. How do we? How do, I mean, we just turned purple. Was it yesterday or day before yesterday? Right, um, purple in terms of uh, COVID situation. Right. Um, I mean, I, I could imagine, you know, that that seems like a pretty pretty high priority to make sure that we we do that well. Um, I can I can imagine maybe perhaps some of those funds could be used for that. Perhaps that would be would be useful, and it's actually earmarked for it. And it it seems like a health and safety thing. Now, does does a history museum qualify as a health? And safety use is that is that am, am I missing something here or is that is that is that you know can maybe Molly can answer that? Well, we we've talked about it. There's not a lot of detail in that definition, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know where we came down as a staff is it's it's not um, it, it's it's an issue for the council to grapple with whether the council believes that it does fit under that definition and is that it is an appropriate use of those funds. Okay, so I'm trying to think of a museum, a history museum, maybe the history of health science, or I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll have to think about how do we, how that, how would that, how would that be construed in, as a uh, um, health-related use? But okay, let's let's move on. Okay, so um, so let's talk about the um, the um, uh, the restrooms, right? So I think it was, um, and it, it's, it was kind of funny is that slide seven, slide six are kind of different formats. So it's a little bit hard to line them up here, but um, I think, um, yeah, I think one of them is that, um, was it the 600K that was used for bathrooms before? Or I, actually, I, I kind of lost track of that. There's a 600K, is that, is that the additional city impact fees? Is that the 600K we're talking about that was meant for the bathrooms? Um, so I, I hope I'm not on mute. Or is that a park fees? I, yeah. I, I, so the, the, uh, bat, the, the bathrooms have not been allocated funds specifically yet. Um, so what we're showing here on slide seven is that, um, there are, uh, there is about $300,000 eligible. Okay. 300. 300,000 okay, okay. um, available, which could potentially go towards a restroom. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. So, um, as we all know, uh, Monday, we voted, the council voted to, um, to uh, basically uh, allow non-residents through the main gate. And um, could that, okay, can, can someone talk about like the Foothill Park bathroom situation? Anyone, Steph, maybe, uh, Kristen? Kristen uh, yeah. can, um, but I also think, um, you know, these funds are not necessarily restricted to bathrooms. Uh, they oh, are restricted sure. to um, infrastructure or capital improvements or investments at parks. Sure. I um, guess my, my, my main point is, and then Christine, I don't know if you were, you're probably aware of this, but, you know, on Monday, we, we voted to, um, you know, uh, open up Fiddles Park to non-residents through the main gate. Um, there might be you know, more usage perhaps of the park than there has been in the past. I think there's a great desire in the community that it's properly maintained. And um, so I know that there's, a, there's gotta be a perhaps, and, and I know that there's already some backlog of infrastructure projects at, at Foothills. So maybe, can you talk a little bit about, so if we pulled the money from there or not, it wasn't really allocated there, but if you put the money here instead of there, what do you, what do you think the impact would be to Foothills? Well, the there is a CIP, I believe, for um, Foothills restrooms. It's 
would be much more than this one restroom at um, the at this park and at this museum, um, significantly more. There are several restrooms at Foothills Park. Um, they're all fairly old and dated. Um, and then with respect to, I mean, that's just the capital of redoing those restrooms. So I don't think it's an equal one-to-one um, -one comparison necessarily, just because the amount of funds it would take to redo those restrooms at Foothills would be substantially larger. That, that said, Councilmember uh, Tanaka, you did, this reminds me, the conversation reminds me, you did raise the question about Foothills backlog for infrastructure improvements and uh, staff is working on getting that back to you. So needless to say, there are other needs uh, for uh, improvements at the, at the preserve. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, guys, thank you for answering all my questions. I appreciate your guys' uh, time and patience on this. So I want to bring back to the committee here. So um, we kind of here are the pros and cons of this. We have to kind of make a decision and recommendation to our fellow colleagues about, you know, um, can someone bring up the slide options A through D? Okay, I would love to kind of get people's, um, my colleagues' feedback on what you guys think we should do here. Uh, we have to make a recommendation. Um, and what are you guys, what are you guys, what are you guys, what are you guys thinking right now um, at this point in time? Um, so if I could, if I could make some comments, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I don't think staff was suggesting we do fund all those projects listed. Um, if we did that, it looks like it'd be like 6.1 million, which is more than needed. Um, you know, if you look at the unallocated funds, I think we're at about 3.6. So meaning we could not impact any of those projects and we would need to come up with $600,000. Um, the SUMEC funds are at council discretion. Um, council put in guidelines for themselves. Um, and again, that's how a lot of that money has been allocated. Um, but council could change those guidelines. So, you know, it's, 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 it was initiated years ago. Um, you know, the example of Mountain View, again, I, I agree with you, Greg, there is opportunity cost. Um, you know, renting to Google is one thing. You know, they've continued paying during COVID. You know, renting to a business in distress right now uh, that couldn't pay rent would be another thing. Um, you know, but there's also the role of a public agency in projects for public benefit versus profit motive. I know in the past you've suggested, like, we sell naming rights to the parks, and, and council really hasn't been on board with that. I think, I think we've um, supported projects. I think the council in the past has supported the History Museum. Um, you know, really looking at, at projects for public benefits, not not purely from a profit motive. Um, so I just wanted to, to get that out there. Um, and we also need to remember this project has limited parking. It's adjacent to a park. Um, and, you know, I think those are things which we need to consider. Um, you know, so for me, again, um, I would make a motion that we that we would ask staff to uh, identify funding for the full rehabilitation of the rock building and to bring this back to council. Um, I don't think I have a second between the two of you, but that's kind of where I am, is that, you know, it looks like, again, people are trying to make this happen. I think we need to consider this new advisory board, which looks very impressive. And if we're really at something like a $600,000 gap, um, that's, we're getting really close. And when you compare it to like, you know, $8 million the city put into the junior museum, um, they're asking for much less. But, you know, it is rehabbing a building versus total uh, reconstruction of a, a building. Thank you for your comments. Um, I, I think that $3 million is allocated for, well, it's pegged for community health and safety expenses. I mean, yes, the yeah, we can move staff it. Staff said several times it's all, it's unallocated. There yeah. are these I guidelines. Mean, we, we, we can move it directly. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I may I jump in? Please. So I'm I'm in a different spot. I could see option A and coming back with um, some additional funding and the lease option or a lease agreement. Um, and I'm very concerned about what happens after the shell is actually in place? Because 
we're simply going to have a finished building at that point. Um, Rich, Rich Green, I think, spoke about 8 million needing to fill it out. They had maybe two and a half on hand. Um, because I've, I've looked a lot at their funding and, and uh, the money in, the money out. Um, un, unless things have changed, the museum was bringing in about as much money as, as was going out on, on a regular basis. So I, I think that we need, I think we could identify that funding. And then I think that we, again, need to have that lease agreement with, um, with the museum, with the museum board. So that's where I'm, I'm something in that range and I'm glad to have, um, I'm glad to have one of you massage it in some way that can can go on to the council. Um, this is the time of year too, and we might as well be very frank and say, if it comes to the council this year, it may get a different level of funding than if it goes in January. So just being very straightforward with this, because as Greg has said, this has been 15 years and one would question the commitment of the community to this that has contributed so little long-term. And, and uh, bringing up the zoo is, is uh, you know, is awkward, but they did raise a great deal of money in, in a very short time. So I would like to see this build. I would like to see this succeed. I truly would. And we've spent, I think, hours as a council discussing how we could, how we could motivate that money coming into this particular project. And we have not been, I think, incredibly successful in, in, our, in, in our negotiations with the, with the museum. So I, I don't know about you too, but I know I'm very tired. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not tired at all. You know, we're <laughs> asleep and I can just go all day. <laughs> I, I'll listen to what you're saying, Liz. I'll, I'll go ahead and move option A that, um, you know, we look at the cold shell option and that we would also ask staff to see, um, you know, as we work through our kind of budget updates at the end of the year, what other uh, potential funding options there might be. Um. Um, and just a note to the committee, uh, this looks a little bit different what Kim's putting on the screen from what's on the PowerPoint slide. And that's just because for saving space on the PowerPoint slide, uh, we paraphrase the options that were placed in the staff report. Um, so I just want to make sure that the committee is aware and that this still falls in line with their intention. Um, yep. but options A, B, and C do have language on page two of the staff report. Right. I do think the lease option needs to be for a reasonable length of time um, to let them raise money. Um, but I think we can leave that un undefined for now and ask staff to kind of work on that maybe with the museum staff. So just for, um, just for clarity, this, this motion is one that you prefer to make, Tom? It's not my preference, it's a compromise. <laughs> okay, but you're glad to second this or do you want to actually make the motion? I'm fine either way. Uh, either way, yeah. Okay, let's leave it as is, makes it easier. This is all between you and, and your bed, I can tell, and probably in, in 10 minutes. Okay, I don't think I need to speak to this anymore. I've, um, I, I think I've dealt with this since I came back in 2013 and we've talked about it on a regular basis. And um, I, I so wish this could be successful. I, I truly do. Could, could we add in here that, um, that um, staff will work with the museum staff to suggest a, a a, a length of time for the lease option. Sure. So, council yeah. member, when you say a time, do you mean a length 
that the lease yeah. option would last? Yes, exactly. We, if if I might, and not to try to resolve this here at this moment, but we do know that the, the museum has asked for a 40 year lease. And if that's- um, for How long? Four zero. Four yeah, zero. I'm suggesting you guys go away and negotiate some other number. <laughs> Um, there may be um, value in exploring a, a long-term lease that is dependent on their ability to raise funds within the first years and then perhaps revocable if that can't be reached. So if that's consistent with the council's interests, we could pursue something like that. I think that. something like that. Yeah. And the, the way that we structured that before, and we could also do it again, is to to not enter in, actually enter into the base lease, but prepare it and provide for a, 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 an option period when there would be a set period of time upon at the end of which then they would have the ability to enter into the lease. So the city would make a commitment to enter into it if certain conditions are met. So that's an, I mean, just another way to structure that. I mean, could it be structured though as, as the lease with um, off ramps? Conditions like, like I just kind of outlined that it is a 40 year lease, but if you don't meet these goals, then it terminates basically. Probably, I think it's a, it's a little bit more complicated. I'd wanna to talk to the, the real estate experts on it because you, you typically with a full lease, you get site access. Um, so there might be some issues to work out there in terms of pulling back from that and, and what types of things could, you know, could be done during the lease period if it has to be unwound. It's probably a bit more complicated, but it probably can be done. Happy I just don't want them to be in a position where they're saying that they it's chicken like and that. the egg problem, not right. having that control. Right. I see. So you want them to be able to say that they have a full lease to assist them with their, their messaging around fundraising. Yeah. Or that okay. yeah, they're in control of it. Okay. Hi, this is um, in the clerk's office. So does the motion that I have here on the board look good or um, can I add something else that was just mentioned? I think it looks okay to me. I I, no, I, I think it's fine. Okay, great. But also if I might just take a moment, Greg, to speak to the to the motion itself. I was ask you that. <laughs> is, is that this is the first time I have seen the five um, honorary chairs actually listed. And the honorary chairs have the ability, I think, to do some very significant fundraising. And that, that's very important at this, um, at this point in time. So I, I hope that that will happen and that that will become a, um, uh, you know, a, a, hopefully a, a new starting point for the museum. And that doesn't need to be in the motion anywhere. That's simply my yeah. my own my own um, comments on on uh, what we've seen tonight. Vice Mayor, do you want to say anything else on this motion? Not I. Tom, no. I think I'm ready to vote. Okay, so um, so I'll, I'll I'll speak to this. Um, one thought I have, and I I do think it's right to. I don't think a 40 year unrevocable lease makes sense because if let's say it's another 40 years that the museum is under, unable to raise money, that'll be 60 years that this property is vacant, right? Which I don't think anyone here is thinking about that, right? So I think what the city manager said makes sense in terms of um, uh, some, some sort of um, uh, or, or maybe it was Molly, I forgot who, who mentioned it, but basically some sort of- um, Off ramp sort of, re re revocable rights. Yeah, some sort of revocable rights. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, that's what you said. I think that's what um, the vice mayor is also thinking. I don't know if that, I don't know if that, that language is that clear though. Should we, I don't know if the, if, I don't know if the, the, um, uh, the clerk could, could make the language clear on that, but it's not um, like the, re the revocation is not not clear in that motion. But I don't know if well, I don't know I who's. It was, it's kind of what I intended. I think just to have staff 
work with the museum staff. And I, I think Ed and Molly understood. Okay. Kind of and, okay. And, and real estate, as you mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, this, I, this is Kim in the clerk's office, Chair Tanaka. Uh, so the, I, and uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois and Council Member Ness. So the wording here and the, the incorporation's okay, or should I add something? I think it's fine. I, you could delete part of it. You could just suggest the length of time. Um, but actually, it's fine. I, I, I think it. I think you caught the the gist of it. You want them to work with the staff to suggest a time for. Or, oh, you do have time in yeah. there twice. Oh, yeah, you oh don't need the time. time. Yeah. Yeah. To suggest um, a length of time for the museum. Um, uh, come in, have, I guess. Yeah, to have uh, enforceable lease terms or whatever we want to call that. You know, subject to conditions. Okay. the The second thing I was thinking about, and it's something that um, I think um, this museum recommended is the idea of um, to help to make this project more financially viable is to have, um, let me see how much square footage, um, a certain amount of square footage to be um, leased out to some sort of commercial entity to help float the project. I forgot how many square feet, feet they recommended. Where is that? Uh, it's 800 and change. Uh, it's less than a thousand, I believe. Um, okay, I, you're, you're finding it faster than I, I can, but um, so, how does this? How does staff? How do you? How do you guys see this happening? Is it something that we would lease it out, um, or they would lease it out, or how? How would that arrangement work? Like, would we lease it out and just use it to defray, like our cost, or, or would, um, what's what's the thinking behind this? I think it's fair to say we haven't really discussed the particulars of it. It would probably make the most sense for the museum to handle the handle it as a sublease or some form thereof. Okay. Correct. The current or the former lease agreement um, with the option that the council had reviewed in partnership with the museum was the full lease of the facilities, but it authorized the history museum to sublet uh, a portion of it. The, the aspect of that that uh, the museum is discussing is, is that previously it restricted it to only nonprofit subletters uh, and the desire to expand the options mm -hmm. for it. So do we need to modify the motion to enable that then? Um, I would say if you would like to change the lease terms from prior, it doesn't hurt to clarify, but staff has heard if that's the consensus to when we negotiate with um, the museum. Yeah, I mean, the only reason why I'm wondering whether we should, the city should do the lease directly is because what if it takes a while for the museum to be operational and I don't know whether who is more suited because they're not necessarily real estate agents, right? Um, and we actually have a real estate department, so I wonder who's better able to do this, us or them? And I, I would suspect, I mean, because they're, they're a nonprofit. I, I'm just wondering, given, yeah. given I, their setup, right? I, I'm just, yeah, city manager. I, I think I hear where you're headed, uh, Chair. And I, I think ultimately it's a bit of a choice that the council will need to make as to giving the museum site control, which is effectively what we're suggesting with the lease. and. Uh -huh versus okay. um, managing it directly. And so you know, I think the, the structure I would expect is that we're, we're leasing it to the museum and under that term, and again, let's say hypothetically that if uh, the museum were not able to fundraise in the next five years, then there could be a reversion or again, an off ramp um, to have it revert back to the city after that period of time. During that five-year period, and again, I'm just using that hypothetically, the museum has control. The museum has that the ability to, again, both fundraise as well as uh, potentially if they could actually complete the improvements in that time to sublet and to handle all control of the property. I, I quite frankly don't think we would want to meddle in their ability to um, have the, the property during that period of time. 
Yeah, and I, I did mean to, to let them either sublet to either a profit or nonprofit tenant. Um, so okay. hopefully, hopefully that was understood. But, yeah, um, I, yeah so, so for me, I think, um, I think uh, uh, if this came back to us as a five-year recommendation, five-year lease, in terms of like, they have five years, five more years to raise money. To me, that seems a long, like a, a bit of a long time. So I don't, I would have to think about that pretty hard. Um, so Kim, uh, I want to be, I don't think anything's been accepted or, I, I, again, I think the original motion was fine. Oh, I wasn't sorry. Sorry, Kim. I'm not sorry. I don't mean to confuse. I'm. I'm just talking at this point. I wasn't. I wasn't actually making a motion. But oh, uh, I'm just writing it down just in case. It, it, okay. No problem. No problem. I've got this as the main motion. Yeah, that's fine. I. I guess I'm. I'm just trying to talk this through at this point. Um. So five years seems like quite a quite a long time. I mean, to have a milestone date. Um. So I mean, we we could probably discuss this at council, but I. I don't know whether we want. This probably vacant for 25 years um, instead of 20 years. So I think we would want to probably see some sort of action faster than that. At least I would. My colleagues here may differ on that, but I would. And, and I would say also that um, I've heard a lot of um, a lot of people in the community who really like this project. And um, so you know, I'd love to try to make it happen. I'm so I'm, I'm kind of with Councilman Nister. I'm hoping that some of these um, new uh, members would be able to really help move this project forward. But I, I think we need to see steady progress towards that um, because I don't think it's appropriate for us to put vacant a property for such a long period of time indefinitely. So, um, I mean, tonight we're just making a recommendation. So we'll see how staff does and, you know, in their discussion with the museum and we can discuss it more at council. But in terms of what I'm looking for, that's something that I think is important also important to the community is that we use our city resources wisely as well. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts. Okay. Maybe we should let Tom go to bed. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're ready to vote unless anyone else has anything else to say. Okay. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Councilman Ernest. I vote yes. Okay, and I vote yes as well. So this item's closed. Let's move on to uh, the second oh. item. Um, if the... I might note, Councilmember, um, with a unanimous approval, this can go on the consent calendar for the council. And the one we just did. Yes, I think yeah. it. I think it needs yes. to come back with discussion, though. I think again, those terms are important. I, I agree. Yeah, because I I think that. Um, like if, if this was like we don't have to have a, we don't have to have a check in for five years and we're tired of probably up for the, for another five years vacant I, I don't know if I could support that um, maybe just to clarify so the direction the motion you just approved could go to the council as a on consent calendar but it would still require staff to come back with the particulars yeah. on so I, I guess I would add that it comes back as an action. Yeah, I, I agree okay so you do not want this on consent understood okay in that case. I, I, we, we had talked about it and it will clearly be after the first of the year uh, as an action item, it appears at this time. So Chair, I, I, again, I apologize to my colleague oh, no. staff. I am gonna sign off now. It was really late last night. So I'm with you. And I was also up very early. So I, I know where you to, are. To Public Works and uh, uh, I did read the report. I am supportive of it, but uh, and I have to drop now. So thank you. Totally, totally good understand. Night. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to the second item. Um, so the second one is finance committee recommends to the city council approve. Introduce it, I'll be right back. Okay, no problem. Uh, amendment uh, one. Oh, we, actually, sorry, we we're out of a quorum. We don't have a quorum at this point. We have to, we yes. Have to. Just we'll take pause. Okay, um, Danny, can you uh, excuse the people that are not on this item anymore, please? Yes, of course. Uh, and just a, a note to the Palo Alto Museum team, thank you for, yes, uh, thank you. Thank your you for the time team. and effort as we've gone through this whole process. I know it hasn't been easy, but appreciate your, your partnership and, and diligence. So thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the members of the public that attended as well.
That's good. Gives us a minute to allow folks to leave. Maybe maybe we should have a five minute break. Let's okay. do that. We do that. Yes. Uh, actually, what time is it now? Let's do, let's do it at eight thirty. How's that? Okay. Very good. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. Um, so this is item two. Uh, Finance Committee recommends to the City Council approves amendment number one to contract number with Brown and Codwell for professional design services on a secondary treatment process upgrade cap improvement project. Um, does staff have a presentation you guys would like to review? Uh, yes, and let me introduce it. Um, good evening, Chair Tanaka and Finance Committee members. Brad Eggleston, Director of Public Works. And as you said, we're here tonight to talk about the capital program for the regional water quality control plant. Uh, and in particular to review with you the secondary treatment upgrades project and our recommended amendment to the design contract for the project. Uh, so with me tonight are Karin North, uh, Acting Assistant Director of Public Works, Jamie Allen, the treatment plant manager, and Tom Kapuscinski, who's the senior engineer on the project. Um, before we go into the presentation, I did want to point out that it's not our usual practice to bring an item like this to finance committee, uh, where what we're really asking for is, a, is just a recommendation to council on approval of a contract amendment for a, a project that's essentially already uh, budgeted and in flight. Uh, so contract amendments for projects like this usually go to directly to council. Um, but in this instance, as you probably read in the report, some early design work led to additions and changes to the scope of the project that increased our um, estimated construction costs very significantly. And the design contract amendment does relate to those changes. And then I'd add, there's also a much larger uh, capital improvement program for the treatment plant than in past years. And we also thought this would be a good opportunity to bring finance committee up to date on kind of the big picture of where we are. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to plant manager, Jamie Allen for the presentation. Jamie. All right, are you seeing full screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm gonna go over our capital plan, the secondary treatment upgrades project, and then specifically this design fee amendment number one with Brown and Caldwell. This is our treatment plan is 25 acres of tanks and pumps and equipment out in the Baylands near the golf course in the airport. It treats the sewage from six communities Palo Alto, Mountain View, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, Stanford, and the East Palo Alto Sanitary District, 250,000 residents. We had our first plan in the 1960s, and then we did the long range facilities plan about eight years ago. It provided a blueprint for our capital projects and laid out the, some of the early advanced planning costs. The plant has a joint intercepting sewer, uh, influent junction box, headworks, and then primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment, uh, disinfection, an outfall that discharges to South San Francisco Bay, recycled water systems, a new solids building that was um, com uh, commenced last year, utility systems, and various staff buildings. We've completed about $155 million in capital work since 1972. In the early days, it was mostly grants. And then we switched more to revenue bonds in the 1980s. We've had recurring capital projects uh, all along of a small scale. And in recent years, we've been using the low interest state, uh, state revolving fund loan. And that's some of the work that's been completed. The capital work that we have in progress, uh, the primary sedimentation tank project rehabilitates concrete in four tanks. It also replaces 48 year old electrical gear. And we're hoping to get this project to you in January for award of construction and approval of our state loan. That's 19.4 million. Uh, the outfall pipeline is a new 63 inch diameter pipe that addresses capacity issues. 
leaks and sea level rise adaptation. And for the, uh, I'll go over the secondary treatment upgrade project a little later. The tech services building, which includes a new laboratory. Uh, We're doing advanced planning and trying carefully to figure out where and when staff buildings get built and rebuilt. Uh, the advanced water purification system project is a membrane treatment to reduce salinity and recycled water. And that's primarily funded by Valley Water. The Headworks facility has been budgeted and we're expecting an SRF loan. That's a $48 million project. And then the projects in project progress, the last line is primarily our 12,000 volt electrical system project to replace electrical load centers, underground cables and electrical switches. And all said it's uh, $293 million. Uh, Palo Alto is the owner and administrator of the plant and all six agencies have a fixed capacity share that's shown here, uh, fixed capacity share of the capital assets. We have some of the lowest rates around. Our rates in Palo Alto and also in Los Altos are lower than even San Jose, which uh, has five times the, um, the flow. So for economy of scale, we're actually doing very well. Some of the other agencies are doing larger capital programs. Sunnyvale there, for example, at 5338 for a residential uh, monthly sewer bill is in the middle of a $450 million uh, secondary and tertiary treatment upgrade. They just got a loan from the EPA for that. Um, you can see the what our partner agencies are paying. Uh, to the north of here, the peninsula cities typically pay more, but it doesn't matter whether it's from a municipality or a sanitary district. Uh, the yellow agencies there are the Silicon Valley Clean member agencies in, in Redwood City, but we have also um, San Mateo, for example, over $100 a month, and they are in the midst of a um, over $500 million capital program to replace their secondary treatment, as well as many other facilities and staff buildings. And they just got a WIFI uh, US EPA loan. This forecast shows the next 10 years for us with the blue being our operating expenses and the, the light blue, the, our recurring capital, the orange, our existing debt service for capital and the yellow bars above the, uh, the line showing planned debt for our new capital projects. And this is a little bit like a Tetris game. These lines, these bars move around a little bit. This is the most aggressive construction schedule we have. The, the lab, building is gonna move out because we're not ready to do that. We're still planning it. Um, the secondary treatment upgrade project might move a little bit, uh, but these, uh, these cost estimates, we're always getting new cost estimates and, and uh, we can go over that a little more later on the secondary treatment upgrade. So on that secondary treatment upgrade project, the design consultant is Brown and Caldwell. And the project addresses a regulation limit from the state on total nitrogen in 2024. It also addresses aging infrastructure. It increases secondary treatment capacity to create the nitrogen removal. And we're also utilizing unit process intensification, which is our way of saying we're doing more work in the same space. Those brown towers you see in the picture can be decommissioned. And we can do more work in the same set of four tanks. We're done with the 30% design. Next month, we expect to get the 60% design. Uh, construction is a 39 month endeavor starting in 2022 and ending in 2025. It's a little bit like a very long open heart surgery. It's very complicated. Uh, a lot of bypass pumping to keep things moving. And oops, not sure what I did there. Uh, we're applying for EPA and uh, state loans. These are some pictures showing on the left some pump stations that move the sludge and sewage around. Upper right is a power distribution equipment and what we call motor control center to get industrial power to the equipment. And the bottom right are uh, aeration blowers, uh, 600 horsepower blower to uh, make air bubbles for the microorganisms to digest the sludge. The system's 40 to 48 years old. It's a two-stage system. The new nitrogen limit that we have now that we're gonna have a, a target limit in 2024. The state is worried about algal blooms in the bay from not improving treatment. Our current design can't do anything to remove the, the final nitrogen. So we need this design to, to meet that nitrogen limit. I'm not gonna go over all of this, um, but this just kind of shows you the timeline of how we got, got to where we are. The, um, the secondary treatment upgrade project started with advanced planning in 2012. Uh, it moved into some 
um, we moved into some facilities planning a few years ago, and then we hired Brown and Caldwell for full design in late 2018. And over the course of design workshops in 2019, we moved the project definition along, uh, adding innovations to get a superior project. And the cost of the changes were checked out by our in-house engineers and our capital program manager, a consultant named Woodard and Curran. And then the needed changes were rolled into a design amendment, which is what we have before you today. This is a, uh, the engineer's rendering of the equipment and showing some of the new facilities and the new piping and the reconfiguration of the tanks. So the design amendment is one and a half million dollars and it's approximately 20% for structural design to handle sea level rise policies that weren't in place at the original scope of work went out to the consultants. It's about 50% for design of new structures that have to be, re or we couldn't repurpose existing rooms. We had hoped we could reuse those rooms, but because it's a 24 seven facility, we just weren't able to do it. So we need new electrical rooms and new pump stations and a new larger generator. And then lastly, about 30% of the design fee is for the membrane aerated biofilm reactor technology, which is an innovative technology that allows us to have a lower life cycle cost, lower energy use, and gives us the full permit compliance with the state rules on nitrogen and ammonia for the full 30 year useful life of the facility. And then the construction cost is uh, 97 million with a class three estimate. And about eight years ago, when we did our long range facilities plan, we had four different projects that roll up into the secondary treatment upgrade at a 2% concept level definition, which was a class five estimate. And the cost was 89 million. And then three years ago at a design feasibility definition of the project, the secondary treatment upgrade project had a class four estimate at 77 million with a midpoint of construction assumed to be March, 2020. And then approximately two months ago, we received a 30% design definition for the project with a midpoint of construction of June, 2023 and a class three estimate of 97 million. So the class three has this expected range of accuracy um, plus 10 to 30, we assume 15. The, the, 80, the 97 million is within the level of accuracy of the class four and five as well, given that there's some variation when you go from a 2% design definition to, to the 30%. And uh, the key cost increases that got us to the 97 million construction cost estimate included the later construction start of three years requiring an escalation of cost, compliance with the structural requirements to meet the sea level rise realities, uh, not being able to reuse existing facilities because of the 24 seven nature of the plant's operation as the new pump stations, new generator, uh, adding the innovative membrane aerated biofilm reactor technology that allowed us to have the lower life cycle cost. And then also finally doing more complex work in a tight space than we had originally envisioned. So that brings us to the final slide. Uh, the amendment one cost increase for Brown and Caldwell, the current contracts 2.9 million, we're requesting 1.5 million more for a total new contract of 4.4 million. And if you have any questions. Okay, hey, well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your work on this. Um, Council Member Nist, do you have any questions, thoughts, questions, motions? Oh, you're muted by the way. Councilman, did you want to say anything? You were, you, you were, you were talking, but you're muted still. So I don't, don't know if you're saying anything. I am I'm chatting away. So I, you know, I'm not sure I know enough to ask a really good question. Um, it's fascinating. I'm delighted that we have this. I'm intrigued by the nitrogen and the nitrogen problem. But this is one of those times when I'd have to say, frankly, um, thank you for the presentation. I am sorry that I'm not um, more educated in this particular field. And it's one of those times when I think you have to trust staff. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I have, I have a few questions. So, um, so this is going from like 3 million, this is like a 50% cost escalation, right? Like, is that, is that the way to read this? Yes. Okay. 
Um, and um, so, um, so Brown and Cod Caldwell is doing the design, right? Correct. Okay. So, um, is this typical? Because I mean, I, if you go back to the prior slide twenty on slide twenty. Um, uh, it seems like a rather sizable increase. I mean, I, I mean, is this, is this, I guess this is, this is why you brought it to us because this is not a typical increase in design cost. Um, yeah, um, council, uh, Chair Tanaka, but well, were, were you done with your question or? I, I'd well, like to I mean, I was just, I, I was like, when I saw this, I was like, surprised, right? For sure. Um, so, um, and, and I think the, the can you go to slide 19? Um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of see this and um, I mean, I understand if the construction cost is more, right? Because, you know, there's changes, but I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about the design cost. Why does the design cost go up so much? Um, I mean, we're not talking about like 5% or 10% or even 20%. We're talking about 50%. Why, why does it go up by 50%? Um, so I'll I'll let, uh, add, I, I think an uh, um, important way to describe uh, the change is not, uh, and, and I, yeah, I'll bear with me for a second. I, I would say it's not um, really an increase in cost as much as a change in scope. And the cost increase uh, is related to the change in scope. So. To your point, council member, this is a really unusual situation, uh, but one in which I think that we've we've approached uh, appropriately and, and so wanted to brief the committee and then uh, especially as it relates to the financial implications. Okay, um, and and so on on this. Um, uh, I guess why wasn't this anticipated before when the project started. Well. You know, when the consultants did the job walk, they said, you know, can we reuse that room? Will that room be up to code? Is it adequate? And, and mm -hmm. when you're at a 2% design definition or a 10%, you don't really know. And I could say, yes, give me all new buildings. Don't reuse any existing rooms. Don't use any, you know, anything existing. And the design fee would have been much higher than the 4.4 million. We have been able to reuse the blower room Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the motor starters for those blowers were so large that the electrical equipment, didn't, there was no space for the electrical gear. So we did have to have a new electrical building outdoors. So it's just as you go from a concept level to a more detailed design level, mm -hmm. you discover the things that you needed that have to be new. And so um, it was, we didn't put it into the original scope of work because we did not know whether we could reuse existing rooms. We try to repurpose things as much as possible. And their final design fee of approximately 4.4 million is um, four to four and a half percent of construction. That's actually very reasonable uh, given what you often see. Sometimes designers will charge as high as 10% of construction costs. So I think Brown and Caldwell is being reasonable in their, their increase. Um, one thing I forgot to do is I, I saw that we have two members of the public who may want to speak. So oh, if the members okay. of the public, I don't know if Danny, if Danny is still there. Do I need Danny. to stop sharing? Um, Danny, do you, uh, you just want to see if members of the public want to speak on this item before we close public comment? Yes, of course. Um, so if anyone from the public would like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone or raise your hand on the Zoom app. And our team will put up the timer soon as well. Okay, it looks like uh, no public speakers. So we'll, we'll close public comment then and continue the discussion here. Um, okay, um, how often do we get a 50% increase in design in general on our, on our capital projects? Is this a typical occurrence or is this very rare? Like how often does, does a 50% increase in design cost happen? Uh, I can speak to the capital program in, in general. Um, it's not very typical, but the, but as um, city manager Shikata said, 
one instance where we do see significant increases is when we change the scope or add significantly to the scope. Mm -hmm. And that so does how, happen how, on occasion. How often does that, like, how often does that occur? Is that pretty common, pretty rare? Like, uh, let's see, well, on, the Calab, times, on the Calab parking garage, we, um, we added to the scope fairly significantly by, by adding um, an extra underground level and an additional above ground level. Sure. Um, I still don't think that approached 50%, but, but that's an example. Um, I, I would just point out, I think, I'm not sure if Jamie mentioned the, the kind of conceptual level uh, cost estimate for this project, which came from long ago before we had much of any design detail was in the 30 millions. And, and so here now we're talking about going from a construction cost and kind of scope of work that's on the, the, in the $30 million range to something closer to a hundred million. Yeah, so there's a lot, there is a lot more design work that goes along with that. Sure, sure. And, and so, um, so a design cost is going up a lot. What, um, and, and I guess I didn't quite get an answer. So like in terms of this kind of increase, is it one out of 10 projects, one out of, you know, one out of five, one out of three? You know, it's not every project, of course, but we're roughly, it, do you guys have, do you have a feel of what that, what, how often this occurs? It's pretty rare. I really don't, I'm, I'm, it, it's, it is rare, definitely. Okay. Um, so, where does this extra $1.5 million come from? It's coming from, it, it'll be reimbursed through the loan that we get. So the, and then the partners will repay the loan uh, expenses when we have a, a loan payment. Okay. Um, but the loans have to be paid back. So the money for the loan has to come from somewhere, right? It comes from the sewer rate payers and all the six agencies. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to have, so this would mean like a slight rate increase. Right. Okay. It's you more know than a slight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For the for the project, not for the design per se. Not for design, but for the total project. Yeah. It's a, large, so, it's a very large project, obviously. Yeah, of course. So, to the ratepayers, how much more will they have to pay? These cost uh, projections are going. The Utilities Advisory Commission will be hearing from the Utilities Department in December, and so they, they we have given these costs for our capital projects to our Utilities Department. And they will roll that in with their uh, the sewer wastewater collection uh, expenses, and so they'll be bringing that uh, forward later. Okay, so you guys don't know at this point, but no. do, you, do you have? Uh, we, I mean, our wastewater treatment expenses. Uh, this project here in 2026, it's a very large increase of 17 percent over the prior year uh, for that project when that loan. Uh, that loan payment kicks in in fiscal year 2026. That's why I mentioned what Sunnyvale is doing in San Mateo. They're doing 450 and 560 million dollar projects that also include their secondary treatment upgrades to show that you know we're all in the same boat. We all kind of replacing aging infrastructure. This this is a 40 to 50 year old system. Hmm. Okay. Um, and and just our curiosity. So. Um, so, so that's seventeen percent. So, is that what is that the kind of increase that a rate payer will see, like no, something on that order? Because this is only one component of the uh, the sewer, uh, the total charge for the Palo Alto sewer rate payer. Correct. I mean, this is the wastewater treatment expense, and they also have the um, the sewer. The they have the wastewater collection expense. So they have these cost projections, and they will be bringing those forward in the future. Okay. Um, any, but so, so no, like, but it's still going to be 17%, up to 17%, but probably less. Right. Like, it's safe to assume that it'd be less than that. Okay. Like 10% or? Any I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to. Okay. I kind of guess. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and then the second question is, um, do, do we have to do this now or can, can this be delayed or what, like, what's the urgency to do this now versus maybe putting off some of this? You know, it's it, with aging infrastructure, it's kind of like the sword of Damocles. You know, well, I had a mechanic in this room and he went to repair a pipe and his, his hand went right through the pipe. It was paper thin. 
and it looks fine on the outside, but this thing is corroding from the inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, this tower here on Sunday, mm -hmm. there's a rotating arm on top, about a hundred foot diameter or 50 foot radius. The arm fell off mm -hmm. from corrosion. And so these towers are 40 years old. Okay. So, and, um, so you absolutely. know, how long could it go? That's really not a question I would like to answer. We would like to do it as, as expeditiously as possible. And then the nitrogen limit is something where if you don't meet a state regulation, you open yourself up to litigation and um, violations for not being able to meet a permit. Okay. And, and can I just add to that and say, these projects almost always take longer than we think. So Jamie's describing these problems we have right now. You know, we've got to schedule how we hope to deliver this project, but there's a good chance it'll take longer than that. And it, it's just risky to not move forward. Mm, okay. Um, and and um, so we, we're in it with a bunch of other cities, right? Um, and we're splitting the cost across all the different cities. Right. Do they, have, do they not have any say into this? We could just say, oh, we're going to increase the fees and they just have to pay it? Or do they, do they actually have a say? They have a say. They've agreed to pay for the design. And so we'll bring back to them the construction cost and the loan. And so Mountain View, Los Altos, East Palo Alto Sanitary District, and Stanford all approve major capital projects because they have to approve the, the loan payments. Los Altos Hills is such a small share that whatever capital expense we tell them they have to pay, they, they pay that. So, okay. but all the other agencies have a say in major capital projects and they've never opposed a project in the past. Okay. All these projects I listed, they've always paid their share and they've cool. always trust, we have a good relationship with them and we keep, uh, keep them uh, apprised of all the cost. Okay, so they, they've already reviewed all this and, and we're last to approve it. Is that what's happening? Yes, we've met with them in July and uh, last week to talk about this project and they were not opposed to it. Okay, so all the other cities around us are okay with it? Not, we haven't gone to their councils, but yeah, the staff is fine with it. Oh, the and staff. They, the okay. councils have approved the design reimbursement uh, up to 5.2 million for three different projects, which would cover the design fee for this project, including okay. this increase. Okay, so all the other councils have approved uh, the design cost. Correct. Okay, and then we would have to go back and ask them to approve the capital cost. For construction, correct. For construction. And then okay. we can get reimbursed for the design and okay. the construction. And then we would have to go and um, do the rate increase for everyone. Correct. Okay. And we'll uh, work hard to keep the cost down. Uh, of course, I'm sure you, I'm sure you guys are. Um, Okay, and um, uh, and and so the, the percentage I, I think it was on slide four or something like that of the percentage between the different cities. Um, I forgot what slide it is. This one. Yeah, the, uh, slide ten. Sorry. Um, I guess does this change every year depending on the volume of their sewage? Uh, the operating budget is changes year by year, but the capital cost is a fixed capacity. So they have a certain million gallons per day of capacity that they're allowed to send to us. And so oh, capital assets are on a fixed share. I see. Do it's very know? similar to the operating budget that changes every year, but it, it's, it's not exactly the same. Okay, because the reason I ask is I know some cities um, like Mountain View, Menlo Park, East Palo Alto have done a lot more development than us, right? So they, they, I would imagine they have a lot more sewage than, than, yeah. than, they, than they may even they had in the past. So. So the operating cost, they would pay for that, but the capital cost, even if we didn't grow and they did grow, um, they would pay the same. Correct, for the, for the debt expense. Okay, is there, do you know how much, do you have a chart showing how much the capacity, um, the, because I, I, I mean, if you look at Menlo Park or, or, um, or like Mountain View, you know, like some of these cities have, have added a, a ton of, New development compared to us. Have have you? Do you have a chart showing the um, or do you know how how has how how much out of kilter is the capital allocation compared to the actual actual usage right now? Do you know? It's very like I said. It's very similar. Uh, Palo very similar. Alto shared this last year was about thirty six percent, and Mountain View share was about forty one percent. But it had been closer to like a thirty eight thirty eight share, just like this capital share. Los yeah, Altos maybe. Hills was. I'm just, go ahead. I was just going to say, perhaps you could explain how the shares do adjust based on development. 
how does that factor in both in terms of oh. financing charges? Okay, so each uh, partner has a capacity share up to say like, I'm picking a number 15 million gallons a day of capacity. They might be sending us 10 million gallons a day and they, they're allowed to develop up until that, that flow max. And so if they're sending us 10 million gallons a day, they could keep adding more and more development up to their capacity limit. No one, we don't, we are not uh, flow limit at this plant because of water conservation and sewer relining. And uh, so we, we don't have any issues with exceeding, uh, our, and no partner has an issue of exceeding their fixed capacity. Even East Palo Alto Sanitary District, which has a lot of development potential, they are not going to exceed their capacity share okay. anytime soon. I see. Okay. So that's why it doesn't be just too much because everyone has a pretty high cap and nobody's right. really, nobody's really have, has done that. Although in terms we, of fairness, we've been treating, we have a capacity of 39 million gallons a day. And lately we've only been treating 16 million gallons a day because of COVID dropped our flows about 10, 15%. Sure. Sure. Okay. It's and so, very... yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, but in terms of fairness, right, I guess, I guess this is what we negotiated in the past. So it is what it is, but um, in fairness, it would be like the capital cost should be kind of allocated according based on usage as well. It's not, it's, it's, Allocated based on capacity. Oh, that I know, but, but no, I'm saying it should be, but but it's not, and yeah. it would only be renegotiated if someone hits, hits their cap at that point. Pardon? It would only be renegotiated if someone hits their cap. Right, and we did the population projections for sizing this facility and making sure it could handle the pollution that's going to be coming in, all the nitrogen and ammonia, um, and so we looked out for 30 years from 2024 to 2054 to make sure it can meet the permit and not, we don't want another capital facility that's a hundred million in 10 years. We're not okay. trying to chunk it into little pieces like that. Yeah. But Have, the, um, the new technology that Brown and Caldwell proposed that, you know, that membrane aerated biofilm reactor is mm -hmm. a modular technology. So it actually does help us somewhat uh, keep costs down over the life cycle. That's one reason we recommended it. So does, um, does, uh, uh, like right now, none of the cities are even close to their cap? No. Oh, no. Okay. Um, like East Palo Alto Sanitary District is 2.1 million gallons a day, and they're around 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8. Okay. And that's a huge amount of growth potential. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. Even though there are water allocations over that, that's mostly going to irrigation. Okay. And do we, is there ability to renegotiate if we wanted to, or is it, is it not possible at this point? It's never Jamie, really come can up. I just ask. Um, I, I thought I heard you say that that our share on the operating costs, our share of the flow, essentially, is around thirty-seven percent. It's been yeah. I could pull it up if you really wanted to get in the weeds on it, but yeah, it's, no. I, I guess my point is, I think it's fairly close to this. It's very close. Base. Yeah. Yeah. It's very close. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's very close, but you know, it's only like maybe one percent difference or so, but. You know, one percent of what one hundred twenty-seven million. What, how much this project cost is still a lot of money. You know, so I, I get your point, but you know, like it's not a big spread, but that's still like, what is what is one percent of hundred million? Like a million dollars, right? Or Over thirty like years, right? Yeah, I, I know, I get that. Yeah, but still, it's it's a million dollars, and so it is. You know, at a time when we are like kind of hard times. It's, it's meaningful. It means something, right? It means, it, it means, you know, that, so, and maybe just a question for Molly is, is there ability to negotiate or to kind of try to make the shares more, more proportional to the usage? I'm going to let um, the plant manager talk about the, the details of that. Okay. Well, and I think it's ultimately an interagency issue um, as well, you know, recognizing that these are longstanding agreements, aging infrastructure, and within that context, um, I, I suspect that the agencies, including Palo Alto, um, uh, would see it better served as a part of our partnership to continue through on the existing agreements rather than try to renegotiate on the basis of this issue. Well, I, I, I have a different opinion because I, I think that it should be fair and split across all the cities. And if another city is using more than us, I think they should pay more. So, but we may disagree on that. So well, I, I, think, I think, I don't well, think any- my, my comments are as much um, 
based on the fact that we have an existing agreement. So renegotiating it in and of itself would likely be a pretty protracted exercise and, and the likelihood of reaching agreement on a, on a new um, share, I think is you know, gonna be a lot of effort for quite frankly, um, doubtful um, positive outcome. Yeah, well, I, and maybe legally we don't have that ability because maybe the contract's too ironclad. I don't know. I, I've never seen it, so. And no other partner needs more capacity. It's not like the water uh, transfer with these Palo Alto. It's, I don't see anyone wanting to take on a higher share because of the additional expenses it will be for them. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure our rate payers don't want to be like, why do we have to pay more? Because other cities are using more, right? I'm sure they're also right. feeling like that too, right? So um so that's 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 the thing i'm thinking about um okay um but so but contractually it's basically it's is it do you know the contract at all or not really i know them okay so the, the contract is it basically you um there's no there's what, what are the terms for negotiation like when well, does we, it we would just uh, initiate a discussion with staff to see if they would want to take on some of our share. And we would also have to be uh, internally willing to put more of a, a cap on ourselves to have less treatment capacity. And then the state can actually derate your entire treatment plan. So we have a capacity right now, 39 million gallons per day, dry weather flow and 80 million gallons per day, wet weather. And um, we had a derating in the, in the eighties and it was a it was a major ordeal, um, and and so we added capacity to get back up to the thirty. We were down at thirty, and we added more capacity to get to thirty nine. And it, oh, it didn't seem we were, like something we'd want to go through again. I thought we we're not even close to the limit, though. I thought you said we we're at sixteen. Well, our average dry weather flow right now because of COVID, but it had been more like eighteen. Oh, I see. And and also with the some of these treatment systems, it's not the flow that restricts capacity; it's the mm -hmm. pollutants. So mm. we, with water conservation, the pollutants have gotten more and more concentrated. Mm. So what limits the capacity of our secondary treatment upgrade project, for example, is not the flow capacity. I see. It's the pollutant loads. Because mm. mm. okay. you know, the more and more concentrated um, plumbing devices and clothes washers and things like that. Okay. Um, but we are adding like a hundred some thousand, over a hundred thousand people over the 30 years. Okay. Um, can we go to the slide, um, I guess, eight? Is it eight? Oh, no, not eight. Um, the one with the rates on there, the residential and, uh, yeah, is it? No, not this one, the, the one with the rates. Oh, yeah, this one, perfect. Um, do you have something similar for the commercial side? No, I do not. Normally, these, I, I haven't looked at that. Okay. This just shows how that we have very low rates and then compared to the peninsula agencies, see Palo Alto is down the far left. And then most agencies are over hundred a month. Hillsborough is up over 250. Yeah. And so these eight, these plants are actually uh, smaller than ours and uh, less complicated technology. But I think because they're smaller, smaller land, sometimes the economy of scale is not there, but mm. this is very expensive to what we have in the South Bay. Um, but I'm, I'm actually proud of our efficiency to stay lower than some of the other plants, but we need to maintain our capital program. Okay. Um, so like everybody else is. Do you not have a, a commercial comparison? I don't. Or, okay. Um, I think that would be interesting because I know our commercial rates are a lot higher than our residential. Um, Great. So you... I, am, I am running out of fuel. Okay. So let's, 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 okay. Um, do you have questions? Otherwise I can make a motion and we can move on. Please yeah. make a motion. Okay. Okay, so um, I'd like to move that we make a uh, move forward on the staff recommendation with um, two small additions. One is we figure out what the commercial rates are. So when this goes to council, they can see the commercial rates. And then the second thing is just a comparison of um, of our um, of our uh, um, uh, what's that chart. Uh, slide share. 10. Is it the share? Slide. Yeah, share. Yeah. The, where, where is that? The operating versus um, capital capacity base. Well, there's, there's actually three comparisons. So one is what is our current, um, I guess the operating is the same as the current usage, right? Because operating matches usage and that versus capital. I mean, sorry, that, yeah, that versus the capital share, right? And so that way, when it goes to council, 
um, because I, assuming Councilman just seconds it, um, this would go on consent calendar, so so council could see it in their in their packet, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think that would be how you'd okay. Yeah, I have this back to like ninety four, the operating share, something like that. Okay. So I'm looking for a second. Does no one else do a second? <laughs> so, Councilman, this would uh, would you uh, be willing to second my motion? If it means that we can. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I woke up at six today, so I, I'm I'm totally with you guys. So, um, okay. Uh, okay, sh shall we take a vote, or do you want to speak to your second? Okay. Uh, are we are we just to be? Oh, I'm sorry. I would like to just make sure we're clear on the motion. So this oh, is sorry. a you wanted the commercial rates as well as um, the operating versus capital uh, shares for Palo Alto. Just for comparison is what yeah, I just heard. Just for comparison, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, um, so like, uh, and, and operating matches the, matches the uh, actual usage, right? Flow. Yeah, Relative actual flow, flow, right? Yeah, so then that's, that's, I think that's all the council needs. And then it's, it's a perfect consent item then, right? Hi, Chair Tanaka, this is Kim, the clerk's yeah. office. Yes. I've got the motion up on the board. How does that look? Um, Looks good, Kim. Yeah, I think so. I think, well, I, it's not I figure out. It's it's just- It's just it's list. Yeah, yeah, list list the, it's just, do you have the same chart that we have, the same slide what, as what we bullet have? are you looking at, five or? Oh, or we're looking four? at slide number- Okay, um, to list out, 11. or to list? To um, identify. All right, whatever that verb is that you need, what the commercial rates are. The comparison, the commercial comparison. Um, to do a commercial comparison? Yeah, just re replicate slide 11 but for commercial. So if you go to slide 11, whatever's on slide 11, just do it for commercial, not just residential. And that's, that's it. To do a commercial comparison of rates. And I guess five, we have to say, compare the operating versus ca capital. Uh, share. Operating share versus capital share. Yeah, it's instead of basis, it's probably share. Yeah, it's That's probably the share. term we use. Yeah. Versus capital share, not base. I think so. That's probably Fixed more. capital share versus the operating share, which is changes from year to year. Okay. Actually, while you're at it, you also have the caps, right? Maybe that's also good to put in there. Like what the caps are. The flow caps? Yeah. Okay. You're not talking about you're not talking about a letter. You're talking about no, no, no. a cap. No, 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 no. It's it's on five. So, so on five. So just versus so on five, just do versus um versus the capital share versus versus so one more versus, which is the flow, the flow cap. Okay, so you, you, can you repeat a bullet five, please? To compare the operating share versus the capital share versus the uh, flow cap share. I guess is that the way you say it? Um, or flow capacity. Flow capacity. Maximum okay. flow capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Flow capacity share? Not a share, just capacity. <laughs> capacity. It's a fixed Period. number. Yeah. Okay, great. I think this looks good. Okay. I think I'll make that an attachment. Okay, that's fine. Okay, good. Should we vote on this? Good idea. Okay, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, I vote yes. Okay, so I think we are, uh, this item is done and I think we are done uh, for the meetings of future meetings and agendas, which I'll, I'll just stay in line with um, the city manager and, and our CFO here. Um, and I think we're, we're done. So thank you so much, uh, staff. And I think staff what you want to do, though, is indicate that there are two. I, I think I saw two more in, in December. Is that correct? Oh. That's correct. Currently, um, we do have scheduled uh, December 1st and December 15th finance committee meetings. Um, and they are currently both scheduled to have items on the agendas. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, Thanks, everyone. yeah, thank you everyone. So I think this meeting is adjourned and, um, so, uh, I guess I will just December send first at six, I presume. Uh, yeah. 
So I'll I'll just send a, uh, a Zoom to you guys, and then we'll just jump on that right now. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. thanks guys. Okay, bye bye so, everyone. Thanks Kylie for right all, all your information. Hello. Thanks Kylie. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good night everyone. Good night.